Good morning. Uh, so we will start shortly with the with uh, this morning's lecture. Um, so I'm recording this uh, video. Uh, I'm not sure how to make the recording available to you afterwards, but I'll see with the organi organizers. Um, uh, okay, thanks, Maxime, for the precision. Um, if you have any questions during uh, the lecture, uh, feel free to use either the Zoom chat, which might be the most convenient, or the uh, Discord Lectures Day 5 uh, chat room. I will try to monitor both uh, regularly. Uh, uh, occasionally, uh, if there is a, a big problem and I don't see anything in the chat, so you, you might turn on your mic and uh, speak up and tell me there is a big problem. Okay, uh, so this morning uh, we will do an introduction to um, da databases, basically, uh, to more precisely relational database management systems, uh, which are uh, methods and tools that are very useful to manage, process a uh, large amount of data. Uh, so the, to the goal of um, the um, lecture is uh, twofold. Uh, the first is to give you some uh, insight into uh, the general backgrounds and general uh, setting of uh, database management systems, what they are used for, um, uh, on what kind of models they are, they are based, how you can uh, reason with them. And uh, the, the second part is to uh, teach you a bit more concretely how to use a specific kind of database management system in practice, which are relational database management systems, the um, most commonly used uh, kind, uh, and uh, how to um, uh, use the SQL language, uh, which is a sound language for uh, uh, relational database management systems, uh, to actually um, uh, query data in practice. Uh, so for those of you who attend the uh, lab session this afternoon, uh, we will put what we uh, uh, discuss this morning in practice uh, by using SQL to process uh, relatively large data sets uh, related to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay, um, so I'm Pierre Senelal, I'm a professor at uh, Economal Superior, uh, member of uh, PSL University. Uh, my um, team and uh, department are also affiliated with uh, INRIA and CNRS, uh, and uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at uh, Telecom Paris. So, uh, let's start with an introduction to uh, data management. So, the um, first uh, note is that uh, numerous applications, uh, whether they are software applications, uh, websites, uh, data science projects, whatever, uh, have a need to manage data. Managing data means structuring the data that is useful to the application, uh, means storing the data somewhere and that the data stays there even if uh, the machine on which it's, it is stored is uh, rebooted, even if the application uh, that was running the uh, system uh, is, uh, is stopped. Uh, there is a need to efficiently retrieve information. So in database term, we talk about querying information and possibly within large volume of data. There is a need to uh, have facilities for updating this data. Uh, and checking that uh, whenever you update data, you actually don't do uh, uh, something bad uh, mistakenly, for instance, uh, violating some structural constraints. And there is often a need uh, for the data to be accessed and updated by multiple users, uh, possibly at the same time, uh, and uh, for everything to just work. Uh, it's also often desirable to access the same uh, data from several distinct applications, from distinct computers. Uh, and so actually in the lab session this afternoon, we will have this need of structuring data, of storing them persistently, of efficiently querying them because uh, they are too large to be uh, uh, to use ad hoc methods. Not quite updating the data because we will we'll not uh, we will we'll not modify it, uh, but you will access the data concurrently, uh, um, and it will be the same uh, the same database. 
and we will develop several distinct applications to access it because we will access the database directly using a command line client and we will use the Python programming to access it. So let's take a traditional example, not a data science example, of um, uh, an application that requires uh, data management. Let's take the information system of a hotel. Uh, so in order to manage the information, uh, a hotel needs to have some centralized data that is accessible from the front desk, that is accessible from a website where maybe you can book the uh, uh, book rooms and probably some accounting uh, uh, software or some reporting software, whatever. Uh, and so in such uh, an information system, uh, a hotel will need to uh, be able to present structured data. Uh, they will need to model rooms, customers, reservations, uh, rates, uh, etc. Uh, obviously, they need uh, uh, for data not to be lost uh, if uh, the applications are not used at the moment or if even something bad happens, like a general power cut. Uh, they need to be able to retrieve data efficiently to find uh, in a quasi-instantaneous manner uh, which rooms are booked, by whom, on, the, on which date, uh, and within a history that may span several years or even possible decades. Uh, they need to be able to easily add the reservations and need to be able to make sure that uh, two people are not occupying the same room on the same day. And then uh, the customer, the front desk agent, the accountant uh, must also have different views of the data. Uh, for instance, some of the information is confidential. A guest should not know about the reservations of other guests. Uh, a front desk agent may not need to know about uh, minute details that will matter to an accountant. Uh, so they will have to have different uh, views over the data. And then another problem is that uh, we want to make sure that different customers cannot book the same room at the same instant. If they see that a room is free and they try to book it exactly at the same instant, well, one of the reservation requests should fail. So let's see how we could uh, try to implement that if we knew nothing about database management systems. Uh, so we have a concrete application to implement, a hotel information system. Uh, let's say we have to implement the uh, um, software that the front, front desk agent is using. How would we do that? Well, we take the, uh, uh, our favorite programming language and we will start coding. So first, we will need to uh, implement in our programming language some data structures that represent all useful data like rooms, uh, rates, reservations, etc. And then since we need to store the data permanently, persistently, uh, we will need to define some file formats to store the data on disk. And we will need to define a, a mechanism to regularly synchronize data between what is in memory and what is on disk. Uh, and a mechanism to uh, retrieve data in case of failure and make sure that no data is lost and that uh, uh, the data is in a consistent state. Then we will need to store the data of the application uh, in the memory of the application and probably use a common data structure such as binary search trees or hash tables to efficiently access the data. Uh, and uh, we will need to implement some uh, uh, algorithms like a searching algorithm, sorting algorithm, aggregation, uh, graph traversal in some cases, uh, uh, to be able to find the data efficiently. Um, and then we also need to implement update functionalities uh, so that uh, the front desk agent can add a reservation, for instance, and we, will, we need to make sure to add in these update functionalities uh, some code that checks that uh, nothing bad is happening. Okay, so for instance, that we don't try to book a room that doesn't exist. And then, uh, well, we need to uh, add the uh, authentication mechanism to the software we're developing so that different users have different roles that uh, uh, the front desk agent need to authenticate with login and password, uh, and that the customer who accesses data somehow uh, cannot have uh, all confidential information. Uh, we need to be able to process data concurrently, so we need to use uh, multi-threaded programming, for instance, to answer different queries at the same time. 
And as always, when you do multi-threaded programming, concurrent programming, you need to uh, make sure you avoid any possible race conditions, like two customers booking a room at the same time, the same room at the same time, uh, using mechanisms such as locks and semaphores. And then you need to uh, have all this data accessible, uh, so from a website. So you need to define a communication protocol between the application that is storing the data and the web server. Uh, from some Windows software that the uh, front desk agent is using, from some business accounting suites that uh, the accountant is using, etc. So this is actually a lot of work uh, to implement all of this. And not only is it an, a lot of work, but uh, in order to do that uh, in a clean way, uh, in a way that works and with no bugs, you need to have a programmer that masters object-oriented programming for data structures, uh, that masters serialization for putting data on disk, failover to uh, be able to uh, recover from a, uh, from a failure, data structures and algorithms, uh, uh, managing integrity constraints, managing user roles, uh, parallel and concurrent programming, concurrency control to avoid uh, race conditions, networking, etc. Uh, this is uh, a bit excessive to ask for uh, the uh, developer of the application to be able to master all of this. So probably we need a team of people with various expertise to develop this. And this is just a simple thing. This is just the information system of a hotel. This should not be too hard to develop something like this. And then every time you have to develop an application that um, does the same kind of things that has data to manage that needs to handle uh, um, uh, failures, uh, uh, concurrency, uh, access from multiple roles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You need to redo everything. You need to redevelop everything for every single application. So this is how it was until the 70s, basically. And then, uh, starting from the 70s, a kind of software emerged, uh, which has been called the database management system whose role is to simplify the design of applications that handle data by basically providing all the features that we uh, need to uh, develop a data-driven application, uh, basically for free or almost for free. Uh, and by providing a unified way to access the functionalities required for data management, whatever the application, if it's for a uh, hotel information system, for an airline uh, uh, booking system, for websites, uh, for a blog, whatever. So we will talk and we will use database management system, which are these dedicated software whose role is to simplify the uh, design of um, data-driven applications and to provide a lot of uh, necessary features uh, for all kinds of data driven uh, applications with a unified interface. Uh, when I talk about database, well, a database will be a collection of data that will be stored or managed uh, within a database management system. Uh, so sometimes uh, in, um, uh, in speaking, uh, one may uh, uh, Confound the two, one may call the database management system a database. I will try to be a little bit uh, more formal in the, in the way I call things, uh, just, just to be clear. So there are lots, lots of the, uh, database management systems. There are dozens of database management systems that are used in practice, that, are, that have a, a user base. And there are different types of uh, database management systems. So the first type, the historical type, the type that has been prevalent since the end of the 70s, is relational database management systems. So in relational database management systems, data is structured in tables, in relations, in name of relation, just in tables. And you have a complex query language, which is called SQL or SQL, uh, uh, which allows to manipulate this data. And Generally speaking, relational database management systems provide rich features. Uh, lots or, or basically everything that I've talked to, uh, I've talked about so far, uh, failover, concurrency control, uh, user roles, uh, views of data, et cetera, et cetera, are provided by relational database management systems. 
This is the main type we will talk today, uh, to talk about today. This is the type we are going to use in the lab session. It's not the only type. There are other kinds of uh, database management systems. Uh, so uh, one type is uh, XML databases. Uh, the idea of XML databases is that some kind of applications don't want to structure data in tables because the data uh, structure does not fit uh, uh, in a nice way as uh, the structure of tables, but they want to structure data as trees. Uh, and uh, they still want to be able to do complex queries and they still want to basically have the same kind of features as a relational database management system, but they want to uh, have a different kind of data representation. Uh, so XML databases are, are, are for this purpose. Another kind of data representation is trying to model data not as tables, not as trees, but as graphs. Um, or possibly as uh, triples, uh, uh, a triple just being a subject predicate object, which is basically a link between a subject and an object annotated with some kind of predicate. So it's also basically a graph. Uh, and so graph databases or triple stores uh, are um, another kind of database management systems where data is represented as graphs and where you also have complex queries that express this time uh, navigation uh, over the graph. Uh, I'm, I'm just briefly discussing these types here. At the end of the lecture, I will go back to uh, non-relational database management system and say a little bit more about when it's uh, uh, interesting to um, uh, use them. Then you have an object database uh, system which, are, um, uh, which have a data model that is inspired by object-oriented programming. Uh, also, again, a complex data model. And then you have other kind of uh, databases uh, where um, basically all these complex data, whether they are structured as tables, as trees, as graphs, or uh, as objects, uh, was deemed to be too much. And where uh, it's considered that you can actually represent data in a simpler way and still have a lot of uh, the features that you need. Uh, so this is a realm, for instance, of document stores, um, where the data is kind of still complex because you have a, a, a hierarchical view of, uh, of data using a document-like structure, a JSON-like structure, for instance. Uh, but you typically don't have a very rich query language. You're just uh, retrieving documents and doing some basic operations over the documents. You have key-value stores with a very simple, very basic uh, data model. Uh, where you just have uh, pairs of key value, uh, but to focus on performance uh, and uh, we try to have uh, data that is as, uh, I mean, uh, data access that is as fast as possible. And uh, final kind of database management systems is called column stores uh, with a data model that is kind of in between the key value model and the relational model. Uh, and there the focus is on iteration uh, on given columns of data and aggregation of the data within a column. Uh, so I will go back to all these types at the end of the lecture, but basically everything but the first has been um, described under the very vague term of uh, NoSQL databases, uh, NoSQL database management systems. Uh, so NoSQL doesn't mean something very precise. It's basically every kind of database management system that is not a relational database management system. And so at the end of the lecture, I will talk about when it might make sense to uh, use NoSQL database management system and when you should just stick to uh, a traditional relational database management systems. <clears throat> okay, so um, don't hesitate if you have any questions so far, uh, just type your question in the Zoom chat, for instance, and uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer it. Uh, if, yep. Uh, what types are the most commonly used? Well, basically all of them are very commonly used. Uh, I would say, I mean, the relational type is the, uh, by far the most heavily used. Uh, um, uh, in uh, some modern application and some application that require uh, specific uh, uh, needs, uh, NoSQL databases and especially uh, uh, documents, stores, key value stores, uh, have uh, uh, quite some um, uh, popularity. Uh, but I would say that all of the types that I've, uh, I've been here have been used for real applications uh, by a non-negligible amount of users. 
but by far the relational database management system type is uh, the uh, most prevalent one and has been uh, uh, for a long time. Okay, uh, so we will now talk about specifically the relation model. Uh, so how uh, do we represent relational databases in the uh, relational model so that they can be stored uh, in relational database management systems? So this uh, part of the lecture is going to be uh, a bit theoretical because we want to abstract away uh, how a particular uh, system is working and we want to consider on what kind of representation uh, we are um, uh, what kind of representation we are using. Uh, in, uh, in, in the further parts, I will talk more precisely about one uh, specific query language and how to do queries in practice. But I want to uh, first abstract away and see what is the model. And uh, so this is called the racial model. And uh, what kind of features we expect from a query language uh, and how can we model them in a kind of abstract way. And this is the role of the relational algebra. Okay, so I'm going to talk about relational database management systems, and I'm going to talk specifically about classical relational database management systems. At the very end of the lecture, I will uh, just uh, mention that there are other kind of relational database management systems that have been sometimes called new SQL systems uh, that basically uh, have the same data model but have different implementation principles. For now, I'm sticking with the uh, classical uh, model. So, all these database management systems, so you see a list uh, on the slide of the most popular one. You have the commercial one. Oracle uh, is a leading industry uh, in uh, databases. Uh, and um, so there are systems, the Oracle database is uh, heavily used in uh, enterprise environments. But Microsoft has a SQL Server, IBM has DB2. Um, Sybase is a very popular database management system also. In the open source world, you basically have three main um, relational database management systems. SQL, SQLite, which is a small one uh, that is uh, used in embedded environments, that is used when you need a small, simple database layer within, a, within an application. And then two more features one, featured ones, uh, MySQL um, and, Postgres, uh, and Postgres. Uh, both of them have comparable features. Postgres is a little bit richer in terms of uh, features and a little bit, is a little bit more professional in some sense. Uh, but both of them are quite comparable. Uh, in the lab session this afternoon, we'll use Postgres. So all of them have a lot of things in common. Uh, they use a standard query language, which is SQL. Uh, the data is stored on disk. Um, and uh, so traditionally, it's on. Um, magnetic disk on hard drives. Uh, it's uh, more and more it's on uh, solid state uh, drives, but uh, uh, still it's meant to store data on disk, not in memory. Uh, relations, so the tables that structure the data, are stored line by line. Uh, so this might be a weird remark, but uh, other kind of data, data systems, in particular column stores, stores the relations differently. They store them column by column. And it has practical implications uh, we, uh, uh, with respect to query performance, for instance. And all of them are centralized systems. Uh, so there is a central uh, database server. There are limited distribution possibilities. It's possible to configure the database system so that the data is distributed over, uh, uh, I don't know, a dozen of machines, for instance. But they are not meant to be used at a very large scale. So for instance, if um, a company such as Google needs to uh, uh, distribute data over thousands of machines, and they do need to do that for a number of uh, applications. They will not be able to use classical relational database management systems. They will use other kinds of relational database management system products. Uh, but, but for uh, uh, most common uh, applications, even uh, storing quite large amount of data, uh, classical relational database management systems uh, are very well uh, adapted. So let's discuss a little bit the data model. So uh, uh, a database, uh, with, which is stored within a relational database management system, uh, has a schema. 
the schema of the database describes basically what the type what the, of the data is, how the data is structured. Uh, so to abstract things a bit away, we are going to assume that we have a set of uh, labels um, and just afterwards I will give you practical examples of what this might be. Uh, so labels uh, uh, will just be names that we give to tables, that we give to table columns, etc. We'll assume that we have sets of values uh, and the values will be whatever we store in the database. Um, and we'll assume that we'll have sets of types and a type, one specific type is just a set of values. Uh, so basically, we have the types of character strings, you have the types of integers, etc. And one type is just a set of values. Now, uh, what we call a relation schema, or sometimes a table schema, is a tuple. And so we, we, we say that the relation schema, schema is of RETN uh, if uh, uh, the tuple is an N tuple, is a tuple of RETN. Uh, each element of this tuple is called an attribute. An attribute is uh, defined by two things, a label and a, and a type. So a relation schema is a sequence of attributes, each attribute uh, having a type and a label. And we just require that all the labels are distinct, that within a relation schema, you don't have the same um, uh, label of an attribute occurring twice. So a relation schema is basically uh, something that tells you how a relation, how a table uh, is structured. And a table has n columns and we call these columns attributes. And each column has a, pair, uh, has a label, has a name, the column name, and has a type, which is a type of values that will be allowed within the table. Uh, so it's just a formal way to say that we are going to define whenever we are working with the relational model for every table that we are going to use, we are going to define the number of columns that this table has and for each column, its name and its type. Nothing more complicated than that. And then a database schema is just a uh, collection of, uh, a finite collection of relation schemas, each being given a name, each being given label. So the database schema is a set of table names and finite set of table names. And each table name is associated with a relation schema. For each table, we say, well, this table has n attributes. The first attribute uh, is called this and has this type. The second attribute is called that and has that type, etc. So simple example, sorry, I uh, had some problem with the slides. Simple example uh, of a database schema. Uh, we are going to define the set of labels, L, as just this set of alphanumeric character strings starting with a letter. Uh, so basically what's uh, used to, uh, as an identifier in most uh, programming languages, and basically also what's uh, used uh, in SQL uh, as a, a legal label that you can assign to a, a, an attribute or to a table legal name that you can give to an attribute or to a table. So a set of values will just say that uh, values are just finite sequence of bits, um, just uh, anything that you can uh, finitely represent uh, uh, on the computer. And types are uh, specific types such as integer, which will be um, uh, uh, all the integers you can represent as a sequence of bits and that are I don't know, between minus two to the 31 and two to the 31 minus one. Uh, real, which are uh, uh, floating point numbers uh, representing using a specific uh, standard as a finite sequence of bits. Uh, character strings uh, using a specific uh, encoding. Uh, dates uh, using a specific way to turn date into a character string, which itself will be uh, represented as a finite sequence of bits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so types are just um, uh, common types that you might ex expect from a programming language. Uh, and here there will be types of the data that are allowed within uh, attributes of a relation in a uh, database. So this is an example of uh, labels, values, and types. And now from this example, we can build a database schema. 
And let's say that our database schema, so again, the database schema is just a finite set of uh, table names, of relation names, and each relation being associated with uh, its relation schema. So uh, a database schema uh, here, for instance, will have two um, uh, relation names, guest and reservation. Uh, I wanted to put a capital R to reservation. Uh, this is just a minor uh, typo. Um, so guest has a specific schema. Uh, it has RET3, which means that it has three attributes. Uh, the first attribute has label ID and type integer. Second attribute has label name and type text. The third attribute has label email and type text, etc. And reservation has a relation schema and uh, has RET5 uh, with uh, five different attributes with uh, five uh, 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 labels and types. So this is actually very simple. We are just saying, I'm going to store in my database two tables. So tables, the table I'm going to call guests and the table I'm going to call re reservation. Uh, guests will have three columns. Here are the name and the type of each column. Reservation uh, has uh, five columns. Here are the name and the um, type of every uh, column. So nothing complicated, uh, complicated here. One well, important thing to note is that so far, I haven't actually talked about the contents of these tables, the actual data that will be stored uh, in them. Uh, I will just, um, I have just um, uh, talked about the schema of these tables, which is their, their structure, their type. Uh, when I'm at the schema level, I'm not talking about the content of tables, I'm just talking about the structure and the type of, of tables. Now, now I'm going to talk about the content. So what is actually a database? Uh, first, I need to define what is a relation, what is a table. Uh, so a table, or in database speak, an instance, uh, e, so it's a table that follows a given schema. So it's, that follows a given relation schema. Uh, so for instance, I'm going to talk about the table that follows the schema of the relation schema guest here. So uh, a table is just a finite, and this is very important uh, uh, that it's a finite set. Uh, I mean, obviously in practical application, it will always be a, fi a finite. Uh, but you can also do a lot of theory uh, with uh, uh, databases. There is an entire subfield of computer science, which is database theory. And the main thing that distinguishes database theory and uh, a number of other uh, theoretical computer science fields is that we always assume that the objects that you manipulate in databases are finite. Uh, so there is lots of connections between, for instance, uh, database theory and um, uh, and logic, uh, but in logic, uh, uh, people who uh, uh, work in, in mathematical logic or, uh, or computer science logic uh, don't make any assumption of the finiteness of the models. And actually, you cannot. You cannot have a, a model of the integer that is finite, for instance. Uh, in databases, everything that you manipulate uh, is finite, and every, um, uh, every, for instance, logical formulas only apply to a finite uh, um, structures. So this being said, uh, or an instance of a relation schema, an instance of a table schema, we all call it a relation on the schema or a table uh, on the schema, an instance on the schema, is a finite set of tuples. And each tuple is a tuple of values. Uh, and uh, each tuple has the same arity as uh, the um, a relation schema. So you see that the tuple TJ, for instance, has RET N because the relation schema has RET N. And every single value belongs to the type of the corresponding uh, attributes of the corresponding column. So it just means that uh, an instance, a table, is, well, a table of values. Uh, every line has the same length as the line that you have defined to be the, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the RET of the entire relation. And every value that you put in the table must be of the type that is uh, uh, the type of the column that you have put your value in. 
Um, so th there is a, a side question about languages accepted by, by finite automata. Uh, there are connections, yes, there are connections with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, finite, finite automata and uh, database uh, and database theory. And uh, uh, indeed, the fact that uh, we, we talk about finite automata that also uh, have a, a finite models that work on finite words uh, is very similar to the kind of theories that we are doing uh, in. Uh, in, in database theory, but I don't really have uh, uh, time to, to talk more about database theory. Um, so now, so this is what, what an instance is, uh, what an instance of a relation is, which is basically a table. A table is uh, what I just defined, a set of tuples with uh, 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 values that uh, are of the right types. Now, an instance of a database schema and we just call it a database instance, or database, a database on this schema, uh, will be a way to assign to every relation name in this database, to every table name in the database, uh, well, one instance of the relation schema of, uh, uh, of uh, associated to this relation name. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example just afterwards, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a formal definition, but it has a very simple, uh, 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 it's, it can be understood in a very simple way. Uh, so sometimes in database speak, when we talk about relation, uh, it's a bit unclear whether we mean a relation schema or a relation instance. Uh, relation just mean table. Uh, it's the same. If I say table, maybe I mean the schema of the table, or maybe I mean the contents of the table. Uh, I'll try to uh, to be strict with the vocabulary I use, but uh, it's, it's commonly used to mean both. So here is an example of database, of rela relational database. Again, a database based on the database schema that I presented just before, where you, you had the two relation names, uh, first with, uh, of RT3, second of RT5. Um, uh, so this, um, uh, this uh, database is just two finite tables. The first being associated with table name guest, the second being associated with table name reservation. Uh, the first has three tuples, the second has five tuples, okay? Uh, and the first relation, um, uh, so if I look at the tuples inside, well, every uh, value that I've put corresponds to the type that I've given to the corresponding attributes. So for instance, I said that ID had the type integer. So everything I can put in the first column of guest or the first column of reservation, actually, because it's uh, the same, uh, it should be an integer. I said that name had type text. So everything I put in uh, the column, uh, in the um, column name of the table guests are text character strings. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Arrival had type date, so everything that I put in arrival should be a date. Uh, so this is very basic. Uh, we are just manipulating tables, and every uh, table has a specific type. Uh, so this is actually uh, something that looks a lot like uh, what you can do with a spreadsheet software. Uh, in, in a spreadsheet software, you're manipulating tables. Basically, you have uh, rows and columns. Uh, except that when you are using a spreadsheet software, you are not starting by saying, okay, I will have 10 uh, columns and these columns will have these names and we have these types. Sometimes you actually write the, the, the name of the column at the top of your spreadsheet software, but the spreadsheet software doesn't require you to do that. And the spreadsheet software doesn't enforce any kind of typing on the values of the, of, of the columns. Uh, you can put, uh, um, Currency amounts, uh, dates, uh, uh, text in the same column. Uh, there won't be any uh, any problem. In a relational database management system, we are stricter. We are enforcing a type for every specific column. This is one basic way of verifying integrity constraints on the data that we manipulate. By having the database management system enforce this type, we are sure that we will never be able. Uh, to input a floating point number as an ID, for instance, uh, or to input uh, an arbitrary character string as a number of, of guests, uh, uh, sorry, as, no, as a number of uh, nights, uh, um, 
a, a reservation is for. So this is a basic layer of checking that the data that you are manipulating makes sense for the application. It's not the only uh, integrity constraint layer. We'll have other ways to specify integrity constraints. So to uh, express integrity constraints, I will need uh, some, more, um, some more notation. Uh, so if I have an attribute, so again, an attribute is just a column uh, at the schema level. And if I have an attribute that is a label and a, and a type, um, which is the uh, ith, uh, the attribute number i of uh, a given relation schema r, uh, and if I have a tuple of an instance of this relation schema, then we will write t bracket a, uh, or sometimes just t bracket l, uh, to be the value of uh, the ith component of t, which means that since we have given names to columns, Instead of saying I have a tuple, I want its fifth component, I'm going to say I have a tuple, I want uh, the component that is called ninth. That's just this. Uh, when I have this tuple, uh, I can call this the ninth component of this tuple. That's a very basic thing. And uh, sometimes you extend it not just to um, uh, attributes and labels, but to uh, sequence of attributes or, or labels meaning that I can write T of uh, capital A if A is a K tuple of attributes. So for instance, here I could write, uh, uh, if I give uh, to the tuple number three in the reservation uh, table, uh, the, the name T3, I could write T3 bracket guest arrival to talk about Z sequence of value, the value three and uh, 2017, uh, the uh, so that's just a, a notation that uh, says that I can index uh, tuples by their column names or possibly by a sequence of column names. And now using this notation, I can define uh, some additional integrity constraints of the data. So we saw that a first way to ensure the integrity of the data is uh, to have types. Uh, a second way uh, is to um, uh, uh, add other kinds of integrity constraints, such as keys, foreign keys, and check constraints. So let's let's talk about this. We say that the tuple of attributes, so all of this is again at the schema level. All integrity constraints are at the schema level. It's something that we enforce on the schema and that we will verify on the actual data afterwards. Uh, first, a key. We say that the tuple of attributes A is a key. If there cannot be two distinct database to, uh, tuples or in an instance of this relation that share the same value of these attributes. So if I'm saying that something is a key, that this collection of attributes is a key, it means that there cannot be two different tuples in the database that will have, that will be different, but that will have the same value uh, for uh, uh, the key attributes. So commonly, the key attribute is just one attribute, uh, but uh, it, it can happen that it's not just one attribute, but it's a collection of, of them. Uh, and in particular, it will be useful um, uh, in the lab session uh, uh, this afternoon uh, for a key to be a collection of attributes. Okay. Uh, a foreign key is a, a collection of attributes, a k-tuple of attributes, of a given relation schema that is referencing a k tuple with the same rt k of attributes of another relation schema or possibly the same relation schema actually a and b may, may be the same uh, we say this is a foreign key if uh, if i look at all legal all valid instances of the two uh, relation every time i have a tuple of the first relation then there exists a tuple of the second relation uh, such as the attributes of the foreign key uh, of the uh, of the referencing foreign key have the same value uh, in in both relations. So uh, a foreign key allows to make uh, dependencies uh, between between tables, saying that the value the, the, this column in this table actually references a column of another table. And I will uh, give an example of of this uh, just afterwards. 
And finally, uh, another kind of integrity constraint is a simple check constraint. This is an arbitrary logical constraint that we impose on the value of the attributes of a given relation. Of a relation. And you want this uh, constraint to be uh, verifiable, to be checkable, uh, tuple by tuple. So it's a condition that you apply on every single tuple of, of, uh, of a table. But it's a condition that you can that can only mention the, the attributes of this tuple that cannot compare this tuple to another tuple. So to make this less abstract, let's look at example of integrity constraints that we want to enforce in our uh, uh, hotel information system application. So uh, remember that guest had uh, three attributes. Uh, it had uh, ID, email, and name. And here, one example of uh, constraint is that ID should be a key of guest, which means that two different guests cannot have the same ID. This is the role of an ID. It's very common in, uh, in databases uh, in, to have a, a, a specific ID column. It's not always the case, but it's very common, uh, which is meant to identify specific tuples, specific records. Uh, and obviously, we, you want this ID column to be, uh, to be a key because uh, you want an ID to be an ID, to be uh, something that uniquely identifies a guest. Uh, email, you could also uh, enforce that it's a key of the relation guest. You don't want two different um, guests to have the same uh, email. I mean, this is a business decision that you have to make. Uh, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it does not. Uh, here, if you want guests to be able to use their email to authenticate uh, on, uh, on the booking platform, for instance, it does make sense to enforce that two different guests cannot have the same uh, email. Now look at the reservation uh, at the reservation table. Uh, ID is again a key of the reservation uh, table. Uh, this is quite clear. Uh, you want to enforce that uh, the reservation ID, which is just a number number that has been given to identify uniquely lines of the of the of the table, uh, is a key. That's that's the only purpose of the of the ID column in reservation. Now you can look for other keys. For instance, uh, the room ar arrival taken together, so room is the room number, arrival is the arrival date, uh, is also a key of reservation because you don't want two different reservations for the same room arriving on the same date. That's quite clear. You, this, is, this should be a key. You cannot have a, a, the same room uh, booked on the same date um, in two different reservations. Now you can look for other keys. For instance, you might want to enforce, uh, but this is not clear, that uh, the combination of guest and arrival is a key of reservation. This is if you only allow a guest to reserve uh, for the room uh, he or she will uh, sleep in. If you allow a guest to reserve multiple rooms for multiple persons, then uh, this uh, should not be enforced. But, so this depends on, on your business logic. Guest. Uh, so if you remember, I will put, put back the example uh, for a second. Guest in the reservation, uh, <coughs> in the reservation table uh, was uh, an attribute that actually referenced the uh, guest uh, relation. When I have the um, tuple T3, uh, which has ID3, mentioning that guest 3 is arriving in room 302, uh, on 15th of January 2017 for six nights. Uh, here, but what I mean by guest three is the guest whose information is in the guest relation uh, with ID three, which is John Smith with uh, John Smith at the NS of the four uh, 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 email. Um, so this means that we can say that guest, the guest attributes of the reservation uh, uh, table is a foreign key referencing the ID attribute of the guest uh, relation. This is the purpose of foreign keys to be able to link two tables together to say that uh, the attribute that appears in this table is actually a reference to uh, another attribute in the same table. So here we have a simple foreign key because a foreign key is just made, uh, made of one attribute. We could have a more complex foreign key with several attributes that together reference uh, another column. 
And then you can have some check constraints. Uh, these are just basic uh, things that you are checking at the level of every single attribute. For instance, you may want to say that an email must contain an arrow base, or you may want to actually say that an email must uh, uh, match a pattern that's more closely uh, uh, resembles the definition of, a, of, of an email. You have to be careful when you do these kind of rules because uh, it's actually quite hard to have a clear rule, like a regular expression that matches every single email. I just put a very simple rule here. Every single email does have an arrow base. So this is a very simple and uh, light uh, uh, integrity constraint. Reservation, for instance, uh, we, we, we know that the hotel uh, has only rooms uh, numbered between one and 650. Well, we can enforce it as a check constraint. In a maybe more realistic uh, example, we could have a, a, a third relation, which would be a, a room relation, where we list all the particularities of every room, uh, like uh, uh, what is this uh, area, uh, if uh, how many people it can uh, it can uh, host, etc. And then room, we would indicate that uh, it's actually foreign key to this other uh, room. Uh, uh, room uh, table. Here we just have a simple check constraint on room. Another simple check constraint is that the number of nights we declare it's an integer, but obviously it should be a positive integer. It doesn't make sense to have a negative integer. It doesn't make sense either to have a zero number of nights. Uh, so we just say that uh, the number of nights must be positive. It must be greater than zero. Uh, this, this does make sense. So all of these are examples of integrity constraints that we can enforce on the database without looking at the data, actually. This is not data dependent. This is uh, for our particular application, in our particular logic. This is rules that I want to enforce. And then every time I will add data to my database, the database will check that all these integrity constraints are satisfied. Uh, if, you, uh, if you do the... Um, uh, exercise this afternoon in the lab session properly by defining a, a relation schema with a proper integrity constraint. You will often see that you will try to import the data set and, and the data set will not be able to be imported because the um, system will tell you, ah, no, you, you said that uh, this uh, was a, a three characters, uh, a, a three, um, sorry, uh, a, 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 a character string that has three characters and you try to input a character string that has four characters, for instance. Uh, this, there is a problem. And this is a good thing that the, that the system is uh, uh, refusing importing the data sets if it violates the integrity constraints, because it forces you to revise what the integrity constraints should be on the data and to have a more precise description of what every attribute uh, uh, type should be. So that being said, there are other kind of integrity constraints in databases uh, that you might want to enforce, that you probably want to enforce, and that cannot be enforced with keys, foreign keys, or check constraints. Uh, basically, keys, foreign keys, and check constraints are the three kind of integrity constraints that you can always use in uh, databases. Uh, it's rare to have more elaborate integrity constraints uh, enforced by database systems. Uh, even though there is a whole uh, theory of uh, integrity constraints, there are lots of research papers on uh, integrity constraints, but keys, foreign keys, and check constraints are the basic ones that are uh, uh, supported by uh, database management systems. In some cases, you want to go beyond that. For instance, in this particular case, you really want to enforce in the database that a room can only be occupied once on the same night which is actually not easy to check because uh, it means that you need to compute the number of nights, uh, I mean, for every night of a reservation, which is arrival plus one plus two plus three until the number of nights, you need to check that there is no other tuple in the reservation database that conflicts with this. Uh, so this requires comparing the arrival date and the number of nights of different tuples that have the same rule. Uh, and there is just no way you can do it with uh, any of these constraints. Uh, so there is still a possibility of doing it uh, uh, using uh, advanced features of uh, database systems. There is a thing that is called uh, triggers in database systems. So that is a, a behavior that you can uh, configure to trigger every time you do something. And in this case, uh, the way this would be implemented in a real application is that every time you try to insert or update uh, uh, a tuple in the uh, uh, reservation uh, table, you will have a trigger that will fire and that will check that uh, this 
complex integrity constraint is satisfied. But this is not uh, something that you can uh, uh, express uh, in a simple way using keys for in keys or checks. Okay, uh, I want to uh, mention a variant of the relational data model uh, because up to now I've told you that a uh, database is a set of tuples. So uh, whenever you uh, try to analyze the performance of queries, whenever you try to um, uh, reason about, uh, about data, to reason about integrity constraints, et cetera, you make this assumption that a table a relation instance is a set, a finite set of tuples. In practice, it's not. In practice, in rational database management systems, uh, a database uh, or table is not a finite set of tuples, it's a finite bag of tuples, a finite multi-set of tuples. So what's the difference between a set and a bag, a set of multi-set, bag and multi-set mean the same? Uh, a set has only one copy of every tuple. A multi-set can have several copies of the same tuples. So basically, in a set, you are sure that all elements are distinct. In a multi-set, you can have several times the same uh, elements. And the problem is that uh, relational database management systems actually do implement back semantics, which means that by default, if you do nothing, you can actually store several copies of the same tuples. Uh, this is a bit of a weird, um, uh, it's, it's not quite a power set. A power set uh, means uh, all the possible combination of a set. No, no, a multi-set is just uh, uh, with every given, with every possible tuple, you indicate a multiplicity. You indicate how many, uh, uh, how many times this tuple appears. Or more simply, you, you just have a list of tuples and you just don't enforce uh, that uh, you have, um, uh, you have uh, uh, never the same tuple twice. So this is actually the, the easiest thing to implement because you don't have to enforce every time that you don't have a, a, a duplicate. Uh, so there is uh, this um, bag and multi-set, but bag is actually a mathematical world. Uh, <laughs> mathematicians do talk about bags or multi-sets. Both, both of them are uh, both of them are fine. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, so, so there is a good question. I, I will go back to the question that, that, is on, uh, that is on Discord after I finish this slide. Um, so uh, this, this, there is a mismatch. So there is this mismatch, a, a bit of a weird mismatch uh, between uh, what the theory is, set semantics, and what the uh, practical uh, applications are, back semantics. It does make a huge difference in practice. For instance, um, there are a lot of results about um, uh, static query optimization that are very well understood in the set semantics case, in the case that has been most studied uh, in theory, and that are basically open in the back semantics, which is uh, the, the case that is actually implemented in practice. Because it's always, uh, it's, it's really more difficult to reason about bags and about sets. That being said, in practice, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a difference between what the theory says and what the implementation does. But in practice, it might not uh, uh, cause you any problem because in practice, uh, one would like often to enforce that a table uh, doesn't have the same uh, tuple twice. And as, as soon as you have a key within a table, here we said that the ID was a key of the table guests. So it means that there cannot be two tuples with the same ID. Uh, so since you have enforced that, you also have enforced that you, you don't have a multi-set, you have a set in this table. Uh, same for reservation. So this is, this is fine. But you need to be careful because even if all your tables or your base tables are sets, they are no, not twice the same tuple, uh, which will almost always be the case in practice. The table that you start with will, will be set. After you manipulate it, them, after you query, after you, you do some reprocessing, well, you can end up with things that have duplicates. So you still have to think about this difference between the duplicate, uh, the, the set and back semantics, because you might produce duplicates even if you don't start with duplicates. Anyway, um, I, when I present the, the uh, theory, I will talk about sets. When I present the pr practical implementation, I will talk about bags because this is how it, uh, how it works. 
So I'm uh, going to come back to the question that has been asked on Discord about, um, well, should we always avoid information redundancy within the database? Uh, for instance, uh, uh, shouldn't we store the days a customer will stay uh, uh, every single day instead of having only one tuple, uh, et cetera? So this is a, a very good question because indeed, uh, in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases, uh, one uh, uh, very basic design rule of databases is to avoid redundancy at all costs. Uh, and there is actually a lot of ways that uh, people have um, come up with uh, to make sure that the redundancy, redundancy is minimized in a, in a database. Um, uh, so why do we do that? Because redundancy uh, often causes issues. For instance, we could uh, <coughs> uh, we could uh, have uh, several lines here for the reservation of the uh, of the guest three in room three hundred two, one for every night he's he's staying in. But then at some point, if uh, we need to change the room of this guest, uh, then this is quite dangerous because uh, if we change room of, of this guest, uh, we will uh, need to change every single line of the of the table, and we might forget to do this. Or uh, we might uh, uh, actually violate an integrity constraint by only changing parts of the, of the data and not other parts. So as a rule, we try to minimize the information redundancy at all costs. Uh, there is a, a theory of, um, uh, of um, database design uh, where with techniques that can be used to minimize information redundancy, with ways to check if your database has redundancy, et cetera. And uh, uh, to avoid uh, possible uh, update issues, to avoid uh, possible uh, integrity constraint uh, issues, uh, also to avoid uh, efficiency issues uh, of having to modify many, many tuples and not the same, we, in most cases, try to avoid redundancy. That being said, there are particular cases where it actually makes sense to have some redundancy um, maybe for efficiency reasons, because if uh, the redundancy allows to uh, to get the information we want more um, uh, faster, uh, uh, whereas uh, we would have to work more to get it otherwise, and we are sure that we not be uh, we will not uh, uh, get the uh, updates, uh, integrity constraints, problems, etc. Yeah, so we can also have a caching, so continuing on that, we can also have a caching uh, mechanism to say, okay, well, we have uh, first only the base information, and then we are going to pre-compute uh, uh, information that is uh, based on that. Uh, so this is a system of views in databases, for instance, so views and particular materialized views uh, can be used to do some caching. Uh, but we need to be very careful if we do caching uh, that uh, we are actually uh, updating the cache whenever uh, whenever uh, uh, there is an update in the base data. Otherwise, uh, there will be a, uh, there will be a problem. Uh, I'll just uh, 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 answer the other question. Do we have an example of bag? Well, I mean, there are usually bags. I'll, I'll, I'll type an example in the Zoom chat. Usually, bags are in, uh, represented in, in mass using a double uh, a brace. Uh, so I can write it like this, for instance. Uh, I can have the bag 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. Uh, this is a bag. This is just, uh, uh, I'm saying that I have uh, twice the number 1, uh, twice the number 2, twice the number 3, uh, one the, once the number 4. Uh, this couldn't be a set. In a set, you uh, you would never have twice the same uh, the same value. There are other ways to represent bags. You could also say that a, a bag is represented as a set of elements with their multiplicity, with the number of times they appear. Uh, this is just uh, the mathematical notation. The, the only only thing to remember is that a bag is uh, you don't enforce that you don't have duplicates. A set you enforce that you don't have duplicates. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about uh, <coughs> the relational algebra. So we have seen how data is represented in relational databases. So data, data is um, represented as tables. Every table is typed. Uh, every uh, attribute in a table is typed. Uh, we can have integrity constraints on the columns, etc. Now we are going to see, well, well what, what, what can we do 
to extract information from the data to, to do some processing, to do some computation over the data. And for this, we are going to use what is called the relational algebra, which is an algebraic uh, mechanism, an algebraic uh, I mean, an algebraic framework. When I say algebra, I just I just mean that it will be something that looks like uh, uh, classical uh, uh, um, number algebra. Uh, in uh, when you are manipulating numbers, you are using uh, operators such as plus, times, uh, minus, uh, divided. When you are manipulating polynomials, you are using similar operators. Uh, here, I will use specific operators that are specific to um, the relational model, uh, but it will basically have the same kind of feel. I'm going to uh, to combine different relations with different operators. I'm going to apply operation on on on, the, on, uh, on tables, etc. Um, so this algebraic language is actually very important uh, in, uh, in, in databases uh, for uh, several reasons. Um, the first is that it provides us with a way to abstract um, the um, uh, queries that we want to uh, pose on, on, a, on the database. Uh, we can obviously use a very concrete query language, and we will see one such concrete query language, which is SQL, but um, uh, we often want to have a more abstract view of these, uh, of these queries. So for instance, when you are implementing a database management system, uh, you don't care about the detail of the, um, of the uh, query language uh, syntax, you just want to have a, an easy view of what your query actually means. So this is one first reason. The second important reason why we need to introduce this algebraic language is that um, what algebra is useful uh, for is um, doing uh, uh, algebraic manipulation, doing a, a refactoring, uh, doing rewriting. Uh, when you have an expression involving numbers, you know that you can uh, uh, develop this expression, uh, expand a uh, expand a product, for instance, uh, try to factorize something, etc. This will be the same here. You will have an algebraic expression, and you will be able to apply some rewriting rules uh, that turn your algebraic expression into another algebraic expression that is equivalent, that has the same uh, that have the same meaning. And this will be extremely useful for efficiency reasons. Uh, it will mean that uh, you will write a given algebraic expression to express what you want from the data, and the system in the background will rewrite this algebraic expression into another one that is slightly different, but that actually computes the same things, but that will be much more efficient to uh, evaluate. Uh, so duration algebra is useful to, to think about what, what we want from the data, and it's also extremely useful within the relational database management system to optimize how efficient uh, uh, data access will be. Okay, so we have an so the relational algebra will be an algebraic language to express queries. Um, uh, a relational algebra expression, so it will be a, an expression like uh, when you combine in numbers with plus times uh, minus, you'll have an expression. Relational algebra expression uh, will produce a new relation. The result of evaluating an expression is a relation, is a table, is always a table. Uh, each uh, operator of the relational algebra is either nonary, unary, or binary, <clears throat> which means that uh, it either produces a result on its own or it takes a sub-expression, or it takes two sub-expressions. And uh, here are all the operators uh, that we are going to talk about, or the main operators we are going to talk about. Uh, we are going to see them all in detail. I just want to, to, to name them first. Uh, so we have an operator that re just returns, it's a nullary operator, it just returns the content of a relation, and the operator is just the name of that relation. We have a renaming operator that is, allowed, uh, that is used to rename uh, attributes. We have a projection operator that is used to uh, remove or reorder attributes. We have a selection operator that is used to filter out some tuples. A cross product, which is like the cross product in regular algebra, which uh, uh, computes all the combinations between two different uh, relations. The union, which is exactly the same as a, uh, as a union in, uh, in regular um, set union, the difference, which is the same as a set difference, and the join, which is a very um, 
uh, relational algebra is a specific operation, uh, which is very important, which al allows to combine two relations or more uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in a way that makes sense, for instance, in a way that follows the uh, foreign keys. So I'm going to go over uh, all of these uh, operators on examples to see uh, what they mean. So uh, in, in the presentation of all these operators, what I'm going to do is that I will have at the top right of the slide in small uh, a reminder of what, what the uh, input database is. So I remember in the input database, you have uh, two tables, a guest and reservation table. Uh, the guest uh, table has three tuples, the reservation table has uh, five tuples, whatever. And I'm going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to look at different rational algebra expressions and see what the results of these expressions are. So again, rational algebra expressions applies with uh, in the context of a database. So in some sense, it takes as input a database and it produces as output a table, a relation instance. Uh, so there is a bit of mismatch actually here uh, in, it, it's a bit of a weird design uh, uh, choice because uh, usually when you, when you want to have a language to manipulate data, you want the input and the output to be of exactly the same type. Uh, for instance, in XML databases, the input of a query is an XML uh, uh, document and the output of, a query, of an XQuery query, for instance, is an XML document. Um, in, in the um, rational case, uh, case uh, the design choice that was made is that the input is a relational database, a database instance. The output is just one relation. You cannot have as output multiple relations. It actually makes sense in practice. It's easy to manipulate, but there is a little bit of, of uh, compositionality issue here. Usually when you design a compositional language, you try to have the same thing as input and as output. Anyway, so as input, you have the database. As output, you produce one table. Well, what table is produced uh, as output of the expression guest. So this is a rational algebra expression, guest. You just give a relation name. Well, the output is just the content of this relation. This is very, very simple. When you apply the query guest on the database uh, that is at the top right, you obtain uh, a uh, relation that is a copy of the guest relation. Nothing complicated here. Let's look at the renaming operator. So the renaming operator is a unary operator, which means it takes a sub-expression. So to make things simple, the sub-expression here, I'll just take the guest sub-expression, we, which we just built, which copies the, the, the guest table. So the renaming operator uh, has a renaming at the, uh, as a um, uh, sub, uh, uh, as, a, as an annotation of the, of the operator. So here we are renaming ID into guests. So, and the renaming operator itself, we name it with a Greek letter row. Um, so this results in a new relation, which is identical to the input relation, to the guest relation, except that the ID attribute has been renamed into the guest attribute. So again, really nothing uh, very complicated here. Uh, the renaming operator allows you to rename attributes, fine. The projection operator now. The projection operator takes as input a sub-expression, for instance here the, the uh, output of the guest relation, and uh, we uh, specify a number, a sequence of attribute names. So here the sequence of attribute names that we have specified is email ID. <coughs> so uh, the projection on email ID of the table guest is this new table, which has two attributes. The attributes are, the attribute name and type are, the names are exactly those mentioned in the, in the projection annotation. The type is exactly those from the original uh, relation. And the tuples remain the same, except that the tuples have been uh, truncated because we uh, have lost uh, all the uh, 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 attributes that were not mentioned in the projection. Uh, so, uh, you can see in this particular example that we have used projection not only to remove the name uh, attribute, but also to reorder 
the email and the ID attributes. Uh, it used to be ID, then name, then email. Now it's email, then ID. Yeah, we have uh, done the permutation. So projection is used to uh, remove some attributes and also to uh, reorder possibly some, some attributes. So often when you do database theory, we don't really care about the order of the attributes. Uh, the fact that email is before ID or after ID doesn't really matter. But in practice, uh, when you manipulate uh, uh, tables in the database system, it does matter because uh, the attributes come in a given order. And uh, for instance, when you uh, process them programmatically uh, with a Python script, well, you will get them in the order that you have produced them. Let's look now at selection. So projection is something that, uh, that works at the level of attributes. Renaming also, renaming works at the level of attributes. Selection works at the level of tuples, which means that it doesn't change the schema at all. The schema of the relation after a selection is exactly the same as the schema of the relation before the selection. But uh, the um, tuples are not the same. Some of the tuples have been removed by the selection. So a selection is parameterized by an arbitrary condition that is a Boolean combination of a condition on the attribute names, some constant values. Uh, we can compare attributes to themselves. We can do whatever we want at the level of any given attribute. Basically the same kind of, um, of uh, uh, formulas, the same kind of checks that we do with check constraints. Check constraints, we do them at the level of every single attribute selection, we can only compare what, what is within a, within a tuple. Um, so uh, here we have made the, select, the expression. So this time we use the reservation uh, table as a sub expression. And the selection is selecting on the reservation table to get only the tuples such that, uh, so this is a logical end, so that both the error hold date is greater than 12 of January 2017 and the guest number is exactly two. The guest number is the guest ID is exactly two. So if you look at the, uh, at the uh, table on the top right, which is in small, but you can find it, find it in larger in, uh, in, on the slides, um, you will see that there are only two tuples that match this condition because the tuple one, two, three, well, for, uh, so the tuple one and three are not about the guest number two. And the tuple two uh, is for reservation that is on 10th of January 2017. So it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't match the uh, expression of the selection. And so you, are, you end up with only the tuples number four and five, uh, but you don't, manip you don't change anything to these tuples. You just keep them as they are. So the selection, the only operation, you don't change the schema. You don't actually change the content of tuples, you just remove tuples, you remove all the tuples that do not uh, match the selection condition. Okay. Uh, let's look now at the cross product. So the cross product of two uh, sub expressions is uh, a table that you obtain by combining every tuple of the first of the relation obtained by evaluating the first sub-expression with every tuple of the relation uh, that you obtain by evaluating every, uh, by evaluating the second expression. So in order to have a somewhat uh, simple um, uh, example, the two sub-expression that you are considering is the projection on ID of the attribute guests and the projection of, of, of a name on the, uh, of the, sorry, the projection over the attribute ID of the table guest and the projection over the attribute name of the table guest. So the result of the first expression is a table that only contains ID one, two, three. The result of the second expression is a table that only contains uh, John Smith, Alice Black, John Smith. Fine. Uh, now, what is the result of the cross products of the two? Well, uh, uh, okay, so let, let me backtrack to just one bit. I, I said that the um, re, uh, outcome of the second set of expression, projection of a name of guest, is a table that contains John Smith, John Smith Alice Black, John Smith. But it's actually not true because John Smith, Alice Black, not John Smith in a set semantics uh, is not a set. Uh, so the corresponding set is actually John Smith, Alice Black. If I were in a back semantics, then I would have John Smith, Alice Black, Alice Black uh, John Smith indeed. I will briefly talk. Um, uh, afterwards about what changes uh, 
when we move to, from set semantics to back semantics, but here I, I'm sticking with set semantics. So the cross product between the table uh, containing the ID one, two, three, and the table containing the names John Smith and Alice Black is a table containing all the combinations of the ID one, two, three, and the name uh, Alice Black and John Smith. So you have ID one with Alice Black, ID two with Alice Black, ID three with Alice Black, uh, ID one with John Smith, ID two with John Smith, ID uh, three with John Smith. Uh, so it's quite clear that the um, lack in regular uh, set cross product, the size of the um, result of a cross product is the product of the size of the uh, uh, sub expressions. So it's actually quite rare that we need to do uh, an actual cross product because uh, I mean, just if you if you have as input a, a table with one million lines and another table with one million lines, you probably don't want to compute the cross product of the two tables. It will be a table that is probably uh, too big for for what you want. Uh, so cr the cross product in itself doesn't seem that useful in practice. Uh, actually, it is because it is a way to express a much more uh, uh, um, a much more useful operator, which is a join operator that we are going to talk about uh, shortly. Let's look at the union. Uh, so the union is a union um, in uh, um, in uh, uh, the classical sense, in the set uh, uh, set union sense. The union of two sets is uh, the set that contains uh, elements that are either in the first one or in the second one. It is exactly the, the same here. So here I'm taking as a sub expression. So first I'm taking the reservation table and sec and then I'm projecting the reservation table on, uh, sorry, I'm uh, selecting only the tuples uh, where uh, the guest is equal to two. And this would uh, mean the tuple number two, four, five. And then I'm projecting onto room. So I'm only looking at the rooms. And so the rooms of tuples two, four, five are 107 and 504. Uh, then uh, I'm doing the union with uh, something else, which is the selection on the reservation table of all, all arrivals that are on the 15th of January 2017. And if I look at the reservation table, tuples number three and four are uh, arriving uh, in January, in 15th of January 2017. And then I'm also projecting onto room. So if I'm projecting onto room the tuples three and four, I'll obtain the tuples 302 and 504. And so the result of the union of room 107, 504, and room 502, uh, sorry, 302, 504 will be room 107, 302, 504. Again, I'm in a set uh, semantics, so I don't have any duplicates. If I were in the back semantics, I would uh, probably uh, uh, want to have the room 504 twice because it appeared uh, in, both, uh, uh, in, both, in, in both tables. But here I'm considering the union uh, in the set union sense. In this particular case, we have done something a bit uh, weird uh, because we could have rewritten uh, the union in a much easier manner by writing projection onto room of a selection that includes both criteria, uh, which is guest is equal to two or arrivals equal to 2017-0115. Uh, 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 this is just an example, but in general, you cannot always replace a union uh, with a uh, uh, with a selection uh, with a more complex condition. Uh, in 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 practice, actually, you can you can show that the union is one operator that cannot be simulated uh, using any of the other operators of the rational algebra. Let's look at the difference operator. Well, the difference operator is. Um, also, the difference in the sets a different sense, which means that you take all the results of the first sub-expression that do not appear in the second sub-expression. Uh, and so in this particular case, the first expression returned the room uh, 107 and 504. The second one returned the room uh, 302 and 504. And so if you take the set difference between the two, you just keep the room 107. In this particular case, again, uh, we could have re rewritten the set difference differently by having a more complex condition in the selection, saying that I want the guests from, number, uh, from room number two, but that did not arrive 
uh, in, uh, on the 15th of January 2017. But this particular writing is not always possible. So the operators that I've mentioned so far, uh, so uh, the relation names, renaming, the projection, the selection, uh, the uh, cross products, the union, and the difference are a set of operators that are non-redundant, which means that I, I cannot remove one of these operators and express uh, the same kind of things. And actually, all of them together have a quite powerful uh, expressive power. We can show that everything that can be expressed uh, using first-order logic, which is a regular um, uh, uh, class of logic that is used uh, in, in mathematics and computer science, everything that you can express using a first order logic formula, uh, you can express uh, using uh, the operation uh, I've, uh, I've mentioned so far. And vice versa, actually, there is an equivalence between what you can express using a first order logic formula over relations and uh, uh, with the rational algebra operators I've mentioned so far. So we are going to do uh, uh, to do shortly a break. After the break, we are going to introduce a join operator, which is actually a redundant operator. We don't need it in the algebra uh, to be complete. Uh, it, it only does things that the other operators do, but we actually need it in practice because it's, uh, it, it amounts to something that we very uh, much want to do in practice. Um, there's a question about the, the uh, I mean, the um, computing power required by all these operations. Uh, so this, these are different levels. If I, if I look at the operations, so relation name is basically copying. So the, uh, you just need to, to copy the initial relation. So the complexity is a, a big O of uh, the size of the initial relation. The renaming, uh, you basically don't need to do anything. You just need to name the schema. So it's a big O of one uh, operation. Uh, the projection, uh, it depends how it's implemented. But most, of, most of the time, you need a big O of N uh, complexity to actually rewrite the table, removing the uh, non-relevant tuples. The selection, uh, this there, there is a potential to do things very efficiently if you have something that is called indexes. Uh, so indexes in databases are um, practical data structures that you can use to uh, 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 to um, increase the speed of access uh, of certain kind of access in the database. If you have an index on the guest attributes and if you have an index on your arrival attributes and some technical condition, then you might want you might be able to obtain the result of the selection much faster than by looking linearly over the, uh, over the selection. Uh, in, in practice, it's quite possible that uh, uh, the, the complexity will be in terms of only the size of the output, not, not in the terms of the input. The cross products will have uh, an awful complexity because uh, it will have a complexity the size of the output. Basically, there's nothing much you can do. Uh, so in this case, it should be quadratic in the size of the uh, input. Uh, if you start with two tables uh, with uh, uh, size n, you will get the table of size n square, and you need n square to compute it. Uh, union and difference, basically, you can do it uh, uh, quite simply with sorting. Uh, it's usually a complexity of uh, 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 big O of n log n, where n is the, the size of the input, because you need a sorting operator uh, to make sure that uh, you uh, you don't get duplicates and to make sure that you are doing the union and the difference properly. So uh, basically, with what I said, selection can be extremely efficient. Um, the uh, projection uh, can also, in some cases, I mean, it really depends how it's implemented, if, it, if you really uh, have to copy the table or not. Um, Difference, uh, union, uh, uh, renaming is for free. Uh, difference, uh, union, uh, I mean, it's a bit costly, but uh, it's, it's still n log n, which is, which is fine. Cross product, avoid at all costs if you can. Uh, but again, we will see that in practice, we don't really want to do a cross product. We want to do something uh, uh, which is more kind of a join, which is uh, faster to evaluate. Uh, oh, so there is a, uh, another question. Okay, so uh, uh, specifically about the difference. Uh, we, we have shown two ways to express the difference, and there is a question, well, which is uh, less costly to evaluate? Uh, should we do a set difference, or should we do a selection with a difference? Uh, this, so the, the answer is, 
well, usually it will be the second one, but it will uh, it will depend uh, heavily on what kind of uh, uh, index indexing structure you have. But the, the the better answer to this question is that you don't care, because this is a job of the relational database management system to determine which is the best way to write this query. You are going to write this query using the SQL language in one form. Maybe it will be a form that is very close to the first expression I mentioned with a set difference. So there's a keyword in SQL that accepts that basically uh, express a set difference. Uh, but you don't have to care whether this is the best way to write the query because uh, contrarily to uh, most languages that you are used to, to programming languages, uh, to languages that uh, manipulate data imperatively, uh, the language that you are going to use to access databases is declarative which means that you declare what you want, and then the system is free to rewrite your query in any way that, uh, that is more efficient and that computes the same thing as the one you, that you initially uh, uh, wrote. So this is an extremely important point in, uh, in, in databases, in relational databases uh, in particular. Uh, we are using a declarative language. You never have to worry about uh, what is the best way in terms of uh, uh, running time to write this particular query. It's the job of the database management system to determine that. Uh, and there is a whole theory behind it, uh, query optimization, etc. cetera. Uh, it's not your job. Your job is to write the query that you want. And your job is also to create approx uh, appropriate indexes uh, that uh, will make it possible for the database system to evaluate query uh, fast. But this, this, this is actually not a, a huge deal. We'll, we'll talk as, uh, uh, about it a little bit. Okay, I want to make a break uh, here. Uh, we ran a little bit over time. Uh, we are resuming in uh, half an hour, so we're at uh, 11.06, and uh, we'll continue on relational databases. Uh, we'll f f finish with the formal aspects. We'll talk about SQL, uh, and uh, we'll talk a bit about other data models and relational database management systems. Uh, okay, so we resume at 11.06. Thank you. Okay, let's resume. So, um, so we talked about most operators in the relational algebra so far. Uh, there is one more operator that we need to discuss, which is the join operator. Uh, so the join operator is represented by this uh, bow tie symbol. Uh, and uh, it uh, takes two uh, arguments, so two sub-expressions. So here we have the simple uh, uh, um, the, the simple sub-expression that are the table reservation and table guest. And it takes an argument uh, which uh, indicates what kind of join is performed. So the argument, uh, the formula used uh, in, uh, in the join, can be any Boolean combination of comparisons of attributes on the left-hand side table with attributes on the right-hand side table. Usually something quite simple like uh, the uh, guest attributes of the reservation table uh, should be equal to the ID attributes of the uh, um, guest uh, uh, table. Uh, it can be a combination of this. We could uh, join multiple attributes in this way, etc. Uh, so the result of the join is a table that contains uh, uh, tuples, I mean, the contains combination of tuples from both uh, tables. Um, so it acts similarly as a cross product uh, in this sense, but it's not all combinations of tuples from both tables. Um, it's the combination of tuples from both tables that satisfy the join condition, which in this case uh, is that the guest attributes of the um, uh, reservation uh, table should be equal to the ID attribute of the guest table. So if you see what, uh, what the result is here, so we have a table as output uh, with um, first all the attributes from the reservation table, then all the attributes from the guest table. There is a, a technical thing here that uh, actually we, uh, we skipped the attribute that we joined over, but it's, 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 a minor, it's a minor thing. We skipped it because we know that it's equal to the guest, uh, uh, the attribute of the guest table. And we only keep tuples in the combination 
uh, where the combination makes sense. Uh, for every reservation, we had a reference to uh, a guest. So for instance, the tuple number two of the reservation table was referring to guest number two. So the uh, tuple number two of the reservation table is completed with information about guest number two from the guest uh, table. And so this is something that we actually very, very often have to do in uh, the databases uh, because we uh, enforce the uh, tables, uh, I mean, the information to be stored in uh, individual tables. And uh, it's, it's very common that we need to uh, combine information from several different tables in order to uh, get the uh, results uh, uh, exactly what you want. So as I mentioned earlier, this operator, the join operator, is an operator that uh, is commonly used when you talk about the relational algebra. But it's actually not an operator that is necessary to include within the relational algebra. Uh, it's something that can be rewritten as uh, a combination of the other operators. So more precisely, the reservation that I've, uh, the, the, sorry, the relational algebra expression that I've written, reservation join on guess equals id with guess, can be written using a renaming, a cross product, a selection, and a projection. Uh, that's a bit of a complicated writing, uh, but it's, 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 uh, it works and it actually uh, shows that it's never necessary to use the join operator uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in a rational algebra expression. So um, here, what we do in the rewriting is that first we rename the ID attribute of guest into temp. We just do this because there is already an ID attribute into the in the reservation table. And if we were to keep ID, we would have two attributes with the same name, which is something that we disallowed. Then we do the cross product with the reservation. Uh, again, I said earlier that uh, it's a bad idea to do cross products because it's uh, very inefficient. But here we are not talking about efficiency. We are just looking at uh, if the semantics of the query is the same and the semantics of the query will be the same. So in the cross products, there, there will be way too many tuples because we are actually computing every combination, not looking at the uh, join condition. But then the join condition is imposed by the selection. And then we conclude with a projection just to keep exactly the uh, attributes we want, uh, in particular, removing the temp attribute that we had uh, uh, created. So every join like this can be rewritten as a combination of renaming, cross product, selection, and projection. Uh, it's not an elementary operator of the relational algebra. That being said, so it means that when we reason about what we can do with the relational algebra, it's never necessary to talk about joins. On the other hand, when we actually uh, uh, manipulate data, uh, it's very commonly uh, this, uh, useful to talk about joins because this is a basic operation that you are doing uh, all the time. In terms of efficiency, uh, if we look at this rewriting here, and if we were to implement naively this rewriting, uh, this would be quite bad because again, there is a cross, uh, a cross product and a cross product results in a, uh, in a quadratic algorithm. Uh, in the particular case of, uh, of the join that we wanted to do, uh, let me go, get back to this. Um, there's actually a much nicer way to do this. We can uh, go over the reservation ta table. For every reservation, uh, for every tuple of the reservation table, look up the guest in the, in the uh, guest table. And actually, we'll explain later, but there will be a, a n efficient way of looking up uh, uh, a guest. And then just collating the information. So it's actually uh, some um, process that will not be quadratic uh, to, to evaluate, uh, that will be uh, typically a um, uh, complexity of n log n, because we will probably need some, some form of log n access to the guest table to extract the data that we, that we want. But as I said before, you never have to care yourself about what is the correct way to write a query. Uh, it's not your job, it's a database management system's job. Uh, so you can very well write the query in a way that resembles the rewriting that I've, uh, uh, put, I've indicated that doesn't mention the word join anywhere. And it will be the, the database system's job to determine whether it's more efficient to actually uh, implement it as a join with the algorithm I've just, uh, I've just sketched. Uh, so in terms of uh, 
expressive power joint doesn't bring anything. In terms of practicality, yes, it's something that you really uh, want to talk about, uh, that, uh, that you really want to do all the time. In terms of should you actually explicitly say there is a join here in a, in a query when you write a query, it doesn't matter. Uh, the uh, database management system will determine uh, what is the best way to uh, evaluate your, your query. And usually it's, it's I mean, uh, especially in easy cases like this, uh, is doing a very good job at, uh, at, finding, um, at finding the right approach. Um, just a simple thing that sometimes we use this notation, uh, so the bow tie notation without any uh, expression, R join S, uh, when we want to uh, talk about the natural join of two tables. So natural join uh, uh, is just a join on the attributes that have the same name in both tables. Uh, and in many cases, it's, uh, it's actually convenient to, to do this. In, uh, in our example, it would, be, uh, it would not be at all a good idea to do this because the two attributes that share the same name in guest and reservation are the ID attributes, and they did not completely different thing. There is absolutely no reason to do a join uh, with equality between the, the ID attributes of reservation and the ID attributes of the, uh, of the guest. Um, so there is a question about whether uh, this um, uh, declarative uh, principle that you don't care about the way the query is written, the database management system uh, will, will uh, uh, optimize it. Uh, does it apply to all the database systems? Uh, so mostly yes, at least in the case of relational database management system. I mean, this is one of the core feature of relational database management system to do, um, uh, to do uh, uh, query optimization. Uh, so there might be some niche uh, database uh, systems that actually don't do anything smart, but all the ones that I've mentioned uh, so far, including some, something a bit uh, simple like uh, SQLite, will have some form of query optimization uh, that will actually behave well uh, in practice, uh, in particular for this very simple uh, example of, uh, of joints. Uh, this is actually a, um, a kind of a decision of relational database management system that all the forms of uh, DB DBMSs uh, m m uh, have not made. So for instance, if you take key value stores, here actually the, um, the query language is extremely simple. Or even if you take document stores, the query language is quite simple. And there is basically not much optimization going on be, be behind uh, because uh, there is not much to optimize. And basically, the way you write your query is the way it's going to be uh, to be executed. But in relational database management system and uh, in all systems using SQL, this is actually a core feature of the of the database. And this is one of the very cool things. And uh, really, um, there is a lot, a lot of jobs that. Uh, uh, has gone into um, making the query optimizer, optimizer quite good. They're not perfect. Uh, you can find some, some ways to trick them into uh, taking a poor decision, but they are really quite good. And uh, in, in practice, it's rare to uh, happen on cases where you have to actually care about the right, the, the way you write your query. Okay. Uh, uh, just a few words. So I, de I described uh, what a relational algebra expression was. Uh, actually, you can write uh, many relational algebra expressions that don't make sense in practice. Um, all the expressions that you can write by combining, uh, renaming, selection, projection, etc., etc., are not valid. Uh, and the validity of an expression is not a function of the expression itself, it's a function of the relational schema. So, for instance, uh, Obviously, one cannot use in relational algebra expression a relation name that does not exist in the relational uh, schema. Or one cannot refer to an attribute name that doesn't exist uh, in the um, result of the sub-expression uh, uh, that is the input of the operator that uh, uses this attribute name. Or uh, some slightly more subtle things like um, formally you cannot compute the union of two relations that have a different uh, list of attributes. Uh, or what cannot build uh, uh, with cross product, for instance, or with join, a table that has two attributes with the same name. So in practice, uh, the database systems will, um, I mean, check if your query is valid in different ways. Sometimes it's statically checked, uh, which means that uh, they will look at your query, they will look at your database and will say, okay, no, you cannot use this relation name. The, the, there is no relation name uh, uh, matching this in, in my schema. 
uh, sometimes it will be dynamically done, like, uh, okay, I've, I've evaluated part of your expression, and then uh, I'm asked to uh, get uh, the uh, attribute uh, that is called uh, total, but there is no total attribute in, uh, in this sub-expression. Uh, or actually, sometimes they, they are quite lenient. So for instance, uh, most database management systems allow you to compute the union of two relations that have different attribute sets. Usually, they require you to have the same number of attributes on both sides, and they will just try to somehow uh, uh, transform the attributes from the second relation uh, into valid attributes for the, for the first uh, relation with the same name and type. But this is really dependent on the, on the system that uh, you are using. Okay, I presented the relation algebra uh, in the context of the, back of the set semantics, sorry. But as I mentioned before, the uh, actual database management system is used back semantics. And uh, uh, even if you start with relations that are sets, because for instance, you have a key on this relation, uh, which would be uh, uh, most often the case, uh, by using some of the operations of the relational algebra, in particular projection or union, and interpret them as bag operations, which means that projection does not remove the duplicates, and that union actually doesn't really compute a union, but concatenates the results of, the both, uh, of both uh, tables. Then you can introduce multisets even if you didn't have multisets initially. And this is what happens uh, in, uh, in uh, actual uh, database management systems. Uh, so for this purpose, there will be a, a way in SQL to actually say, okay, I get a multiset, but I really want to remove the duplicates. So there is a distinct keyword in the SQL language that allows you to actually go back to a set. And it might be needed to use it uh, sometimes, whereas when you uh, reason about the query in the set semantics in relational algebra, uh, this, this comes by default. Okay, let me mention an extension of the relational algebra, uh, which includes uh, the possibility of computing other things, uh, in particular aggregation. So the relational algebra I presented so far is the core relational algebra, everyone agrees with it. Uh, it. As I mentioned, it has an expressive power that is equivalent to first order logic, which, which, which is quite great in terms of, uh, of uh, mathematical properties. But in practice, you want to do more things on data than just uh, selecting, projecting, uh, joining, etc. And one thing you definitely want to do on data is aggregating data, which means computing sums, computing averages, computing counts, uh, computing the minimum of the values of a column, etc. All of this is aggregation. Um, so aggregation is included in uh, in SQL, uh, and it's it's one of the important uh, part of the SQL language. Obviously, uh, it's uh, it's less um, it's less easy to formalize what aggregation uh, does uh, in uh, if you want to build a formal model, and it's uh, uh, less easy to do reasoning about uh, queries with aggregation. You don't, you, you lose the nice connection with the logic, for instance. But still, uh, you can add to the relational algebra a form of aggregation operator. Uh, and the aggregation comes with grouping. Uh, so we, we'll see an example just, just here. So the syntax is a bit weird and you basically will not need the syntax. So it uses this gamma uh, uh, function. Um, uh, I mean, this gamma operator, which is a unary operator, but will, which takes a lot of extra arguments. So it takes uh, first as a sub expression something that you want to compute uh, aggregation and grouping on, but then it uh, takes in the bottom right of the gamma operator, you have room, which means that it's computing grouping over the room attribute. On the top right, it says AVG, which means that it will compute uh, the aggregation results in an AVG named column. And in, in between the bracket, it takes a function here written as a lambda expression, but it's just a, it, it's just a function uh, that expresses what kind of aggregation you want to do. And here, the, uh, this is a, a, a stupid function that says, well, I will uh, take all the values that I have in input and compute the, averages, the average of these values. Again, this syntax doesn't really matter. I just want to mention that you can, if you want, add support for aggregation and grouping into the relational algebra. What's more important is the kind of queries that this uh, uh, is able to express. 
So what this does is, well, first we project the reservation uh, table over room and nights. So we only keep the room and nights attributes of the relation uh, of the uh, of the reservation uh, 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 table. Second, uh, you group the result over room, which means that you will get one tuple per distinct value of room. And uh, the, uh, in addition to the room number, you will compute the average, which we will put in column that you call AVG, and the average of all values of, uh, in this case, the night, uh, the night uh, column. Uh, so this is a way to express that I want to compute the average number of nights per reservation for each room. And I added uh, on top uh, a, sele a selection predicate that uh, selects only those such that the average is greater than three. Uh, so I want to compute the average number of nights per reservation for each room having an average greater than three. The SQL syntax, uh, this is one case where the SQL syntax will actually be nicer and easier to understand than the rational algebra syntax. I just wanted to, to say that you can incorporate this important aspect of, uh, uh, of relational querying, which is aggregation, into the relational algebra, but the, the precise syntax doesn't matter. Okay, so enough for the theory. So we have an idea now how the uh, relational database model function. We have tables, uh, t each table has a schema. Uh, the schema is uh, made of uh, attribute names and types. Uh, we have integrity constraints also in the schema. Uh, and we have a way to query the, um, uh, the relational, a relational database using the relational algebra using different uh, operators. Now, all of this is at the abstract model. Uh, it's something that is very useful to reason about the databases. It's also, also something that is very useful when you implement the database management system uh, to have um, um, uh, a representation that is independent of the low, low level uh, uh, of the uh, query language that you use. But in practice, you will not use relational algebra, you will use SQL. Uh, so let's talk about uh, SQL, what it is, and how to use it. And there are two parts of SQL, the DDL and DML, and so we'll, we'll cover both. So SQL is, so again, most people say SQL, you can also say SQL. Uh, so SQL is a structured query language. And it's, to, it's a standard language, it's a, it, it is standardized uh, within uh, the international uh, Organizations, uh, um, the organization, the international organization standards, uh, ISO, uh, 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 is a weird acronym because it doesn't follow the, the order you read it. Uh, so it's it's uh, standards. Uh, so which means that uh, you have groups of uh, people uh, uh, from academia, from uh, the industry, who uh, agree on what should be in the programming language, uh, in the sorry, in the query language. Uh, this is also what happens with most, but not all programming languages. C++ has a standard, for instance, Python doesn't, Python only has a, a, a main or a, a couple of main implementations. Uh, so despite having a standard, which is good because it means that uh, everyone agrees on what should be, uh, what should be uh, in the language, Actually, there is a lot of, of variability in the way the standard is implemented from one database to the other which means that you cannot just transparently move from an Oracle database to a Postgres database to a DB2 database and hope that everything will work in the same way. This is a bit unfortunate. Uh, this is partly for historical reason because, uh, I mean, uh, the, a lot of features have been developed before they were standardized. This is also partly because of uh, commercial reasons like uh, Oracle refusing to implement some, some, some uh, some things in the in the standard way, implementing them slightly different to kind of lock uh, lock people in using uh, Oracle systems. Uh, but this is what it is. So uh, in practice, I mean, um, almost everything that I will uh, uh, discuss today are part of the standard and are understood by all uh, 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 classical uh, database management systems. Uh, in the few cases where it will make a difference, I will give the Postgres version because this is what we are going to use in the, in, in the lab session, uh, but it's really minor things. Uh, the kind of things that are different from one system to the other is, for instance, the types that you can use. There's a list of available types for attributes that are, that are different. There are some standard types, but uh, there are also types that are specific to each system. 
uh, there are some syntactical uh, uh, differences, like uh, how uh, uh, um, the case of uh, attributes names is, is managed by different systems, or how to quote attributes. But this is really at the syntax, syntax level rather than at uh, essential definition level. So as I mentioned, there are two parts of the SQL language. Uh, one is called data definition language, and it's basically everything that relates to the schema. One is data manipulation language, and it's everything related to the actual data. So data definition language for the schema, for creating uh, 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 um, a relational schema, for specifying integrity constraints, etc., and data manipulation language to query a database and also to update it, to, to modify it. And again, I'm insisting because it's an extremely important point, SQL is a declarative language. One writes uh, a query any way, uh, any way one wants, uh, and the system will transform the expression into an equivalent expression that it believes has uh, the, uh, an efficient way of uh, evaluating it. Uh, so it's uh, not the job of the um, uh, uh, programmer, the person who interacts with the database management system, to uh, determine what will be the best way of evaluating query, it will be the database management system job. This is actually quite different from uh, regular programming languages. Obviously, regular programming languages do use uh, optimizations. They try to get rid of uh, uh, useless variables. They uh, try to get rid of recursion when they can and transform it into iteration. But what they are able to do is very limited. For one good reason, which is that uh, when you write a program in, in a regular programming language, uh, you have a lot of uh, flexibility, you have a lot of expressive power. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to reason about uh, a, a program. Uh, it's extremely difficult to determine that two programs compute actually the same things. So, which means that the compilers are very limited in the, in the optimization that they are allowed, uh, that they are able to do. They, they know that some little um, elementary writings will not change the semantics of a, of a query, but they cannot uh, uh, do a lot of reasoning. This is quite different from SQL, which is a much uh, uh, easier language in some sense. Uh, which doesn't give you uh, the full expressive power of a programming language. And it, uh, as a side result, it's much easier to optimize uh, SQL queries than it is to optimize a uh, Python program or C++ program, for instance. So SQL has a syntax that is quite verbose. Uh, so many people dislike it because of this. I mean, it's uh, SQL queries tend to be quite long in uh, writing. The reason it's quite verbose is that the, it was envisioned in the 70s that it would be an, an English-like uh, language. I mean, it's, a, it's a similar to the reason why COBOL was in, invented as a programming language which used uh, uh, English keywords. They thought that it would be easier to express uh, queries if one used uh, uh, something that looked like, a, like the English language. Uh, in practice, it's mostly a failure. I mean, it's uh, it's not because uh, the language is verbose that it's easier to understand than if it were more compact. Still, that's what that's what we have. The keywords in SQL are case insensitive. Traditionally, they are written in uppercase, and I'll, I'll try to to always do that uh, to distinguish with, uh, with with the rest of the language. Uh, but uh, so I will talk about the select keyword, for instance. You can write it in lowercase, uppercase. It doesn't matter. Uh, the identifiers that you use, identifiers being uh, uh, table names, I mean the labels, the table names, or the attribute names, etc. Uh, they are often case intensive, but this depends on the relational database management system. And actually, uh, Postgres is a bit of a pain uh, with it. Uh, if you don't pay attention, I mean, it's mo mostly case intensive, but if you don't pay attention, you can uh, encounter situations where uh, you will not uh, be able to to use easily a, a column name because you created in a, in an uppercase uh, using a specific software and uh, uh, and it doesn't recognize a, a variant of it. So for um, for the, the lab session, I recommend just to use a lowercase everywhere for the for the identifiers. It will simplify things. 
uh, every uh, language has a comment system to introduce comments for the for the programmer. In uh, SQL, uh, it it uh, it's introduced using a minus minus. So everything you put after minus minus uh, is considered to be a comment until the end of the line. It's a weird choice again. I mean, it's not the, the most uh, common way of denoting comments, but that's what it is. And finally, in most situations, you will need to terminate sta uh, SQL statements by a semicolon, but it's not quite part of the SQL statement. Uh, it's not as in uh, C, for instance. In C, every instruction ends with a semicolon, and it's really a part of the instruction. Uh, it's, it's just a way of separating statements or saying to the uh, um, uh, Postgres environment, "I'm done. I don't have anything else to. Uh, I don't have anything else to write." Uh, so, in particular, when you connect to a SQL database using uh, Python, you will not need to do the semicolon because you will have another way to do. I'm done. This is my query. I don't need anything else. But when you interact directly using the command line client of um, of the database management system, you will need to put a semicolon at the end of each statement. I have to talk about a specific weird thing in uh, SQL, which is null. So null is a special value uh, that uh, you can use uh, for any type, any type uh, of value in, uh, in SQL can, in addition, allow a specific value, which is a null value. And null, uh, I mean, the, the meaning of null is to denote the absence of a value. So for instance, you have a data set with a recorded, uh, I don't know, recorded temperatures, and you will use null to say, well, I don't have the temperature for that day, uh, maybe because uh, the sensor was, uh, was broken or whatever. Um, and it's, it's really a specific value, which means that null is not the same as zero if you have an integer type, non, null is not the same as the empty string if you have a, if you have a, a character string type, uh, et cetera. So, until here, it's not bad. It's, it's actually quite useful to have a way to denote the absence of a value, a value that is missing, uh, a value that is unknown, uh, these kind of things. Uh, what becomes weird is the semantics that um, SQL gives to um, nodes. So uh, you are aware that when you use uh, any form of, uh, of uh, programming, uh, we are using a uh, by valued logic, a binary logic, which is everything is either true or false. Uh, so when you when you make a test uh, in uh, any programming language, an if uh, the, what you have within the test is either true or false. Uh, and when you combine uh, conditions, every condition is either true or false. Well, SQL has made the weird choice of uh, using a try valued logic, which is that everything is either true, false, or no. And null is something that, that sticks. Null is something that contaminates everything, which means that every time that you start comparing a null value with anything else, the result is null. If you ask, well, is it true that uh, my attribute email uh, equals uh, to, um, I don't know, a specific email value, if the attribute email happens to be null, the result would be null. Uh, if you ask if is it is it false that uh, my email uh, 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 is a specific value, the result if the email is null is null, uh, and so this is a very weird um, uh, situation. So obviously, since we can we cannot use a regular comparison operator to determine if something is null, uh, there are other operators in a SQL. There is is null or is not null that can be used to test is, if a value is or is not uh, null. Eventually, uh, when you do a selection, for instance, uh, when you write uh, the condition of a selection, you have to determine if you, if you filter tuples out or not, obviously. And so eventually, you will need to know if uh, a condition uh, evaluates to true or false. So at the very last, null eventually converts to false, but it's really at the very last. So this gives very weird consequences. So for instance, uh, uh, let, let's, let's imagine that you have this uh, a selection query that selects all the tuples in, um, in, uh, in a database whose uh, value is uh, less than uh, 42, or the value of a given attribute is less than 42, or is greater than or equal to 42. 
you would assume that such a query actually doesn't change anything to the data, less than 42 or greater than or equal to 42, it should select everything. But actually what, what happens is that all the null values disappear because null is considered uh, to return the null logic value when it's compared to 42, whether it's compared with uh, less than or greater than. When it's combined with or, is, it gives or uh, null again, and eventually it turns into false. So this is, this is really weird. I mean, uh, this, this has been quite heavily criticized. There is a lot of, um, of weird behavior of that. It's very uh, difficult to integrate this uh, weird three valued logic with a formal relational model. But again, it's what it is. It's what uh, SQL has uh, decided. So we have to, to live with it. In practice, it's uh, in most cases you will not uh, will not have a problem letting you know. Um, yeah, I mean the, it's it's usually just called a tri-valued logic. Uh, the there is a question on on this code. Yeah, it's just use uh, usually called a tri-valued logic uh, with with no. Okay, so there is a question uh, from Tom on this code about whether the generation of code theorem to rational algebra extended with aggregation. So, uh, code theorem is the result that states that the rational algebra without aggregation uh, is has the same expressive power as a first order logic. Uh, so, uh, to my understanding, but I would have to 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 look into it a bit more. And uh, actually, I have a, a colleague within my team who is a specialist of this exact question. There is not a nice characterization within logic of the um, uh, of uh, the expressive power that is given by rational algebra plus aggregation. And it's usually quite messy to manipulate logics that, that, do, uh, that do aggregation. There are other generalizations of code theorem, uh, but not with aggregation. Um, one thing that I have not mentioned is that one thing that you cannot do with the rational algebra is do something that are recursive. For instance, if you, want, if you have a graph data, and if you want to uh, navigate through the graph and get uh, all the uh, nodes in the graph that you can reach from a given node, uh, then this cannot be expressed with the rational algebra because you need to explore paths of unbounded uh, size. This can be explored with extensions of the rational algebra um, to uh, with, uh, use, using, uh, using while operators uh, to the rational algebra. And there, there are, there are equivalence results with logical formalisms that have fixed point logic. Uh, but aggregation is much messier to, to work with. Uh, obviously, uh, rational algebra plus aggregation is more powerful than rational algebra on its own. But to express exactly uh, uh, what we gain is not that easy. Okay, so let's talk about the DDL, the data definition language of SQL. How do we create schemas? How do we manipulate schemas in SQL? So the first thing that you will need is how to create a table, how to create a relation schema. So again, relation schema is specified by a relation name and a collection of attributes. Each attribute has a name and a type. Well, there is a very simple syntax for this. It's create table, keyword, then the name of the table, and then you list every attribute with, with its type. So here, for instance, ID is an integer, name is a text, uh, email has type text, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, the basic thing that, that you need to create a, a table. Uh, then you have other um, statements to manipulate the schema. For instance, you can remove a table or you can remove a relation schema. It's just drop table. Obviously, if you remove a relation schema, you also remove any content the relation may have. But, but it's uh, uh, conceptually, this, this works at the, at the schema level. You can do other things, like you can rename a table, you can uh, uh, change a column, uh, add a column, etc. I'm not going to list everything. Uh, I will point to the documentation of uh, Postgres, uh, which actually uh, is relatively helpful to, uh, to, to um, re read about every SQL statement at least those that are uh, implemented within Postgres. And Postgres is far from being the worst in terms of standard support. It's uh, one of the uh, database management system which is the closest to uh, what the standard is, what the standard says. And then at the schema level, there are also constraints. Uh, so you remember keys, uh, foreign keys, and check constraints. Well, you can also specify them. 
uh, either when you create a schema, uh, so when you create a, a table with the, using the create table statement, or afterwards you can add the constraint after the fact with an alter table uh, statement. And so for the key, you will need either primary key or unique. So this is something important. Um, uh, there is, uh, this is not part of the abstract model, but in the practical implementation of, um, of um, uh, the rational model, one distinguish between one specific key, which is called the primary key, and all the other keys that are in, are in, a, in a table. The primary key is basically, I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's basically the way the table will be, uh, the, the, it basically gives the order uh, uh, according to which the table will be stored on disk. If you say that the primary key of the table guest is uh, ID, it means that physically on disk, uh, you, we, we will start with the ID number one, and then ID number two, and then ID number three, and then ID number four, and then ID number five, etc. So typically, um, I've used the ID example, uh, the primary key uh, is reserved for things that are really what structures relation, what, what, what makes uh, it an identifier. So it might be an ID column, uh, which is often the case, but it might be also a combination of columns that together form the main key of a table. It's called a primary key. Uh, there is a, a, a subtlety, which is that if a, a column or a combination of column is is um, is called, uh, I mean, is uh, is said to be the primary key, uh, it implies that it cannot take null values uh, because otherwise it would be very messy to understand how we are supposed to organize uh, a column if there are some possible values that, that are null within it. So primary primary key implies that something is not null. Then you have all the other tables, uh, sorry, all the other keys in a table. And you can say that there are keys uh, with a, another keyword, which is unique. You can only use primary key for one key per table, but you can use unique for any other keys uh, in the table. For foreign keys, use the references keyword. I'll show you an example just the one. For check constraints, the check keyword. And then you have another constraint that you can impose, and that's a good idea to impose in, in, in many cases, which is to say that an attribute cannot take the null value, cannot be null. You just add the not null uh, uh, constraint like this. Thanks for the reference to a fragment of Cleany and K3. Uh, OK. Uh, so here it's uh, here is how we could declare uh, our two tables guest and reservation uh, using this time all the all the constraints that we had enumerated. So I, I made a short version before where we had uh, only the the attributes and the types. Uh, now we add all the constraints. Uh, so in the guest, we say that the ID attribute is a primary key. Uh, we say that name should not be null. We always want to know a name for the uh, for the guests, and we said that email should uh, be unique, so it's a key, and should verify the check constraints that uh, there is an arrow base within. We use for that a comparison operator in SQL that is like, which is uh, uh, to match a character string with a pattern. Uh, it's, it's not a very powerful pattern, it's not a regular expression, it's just that everything that is a percent means uh, it, it matches everything. It's a bit like the wildcard in uh, Unix shells, uh, the star wildcard in Unix shells. So here it means that emailed is any string, then an arrow base, then any string. Uh, in particular, email contains an arrow base. In the reservation table, we state that, again, ID is a primary key, that guest should not be null, and indeed, uh, we should know who uh, the reservation is for and that it's a foreign key. So we say that it references the ID attributes of the guest uh, column. Again, you can check it's exactly uh, the uh, constraint that we had specified at the beginning when we made the formal models. Room, again, room cannot be null. It doesn't make sense for room to, to, to be null. We need the room information. Uh, and uh, we say that uh, the room should be between one and 650, so greater than zero and less than 651, okay? The arrival dates cannot be null. The number of nights cannot be null, and we add a check constraint that says that um, uh, the number of nights has to be greater than zero. So it cannot be zero and it cannot be negative, obviously. And finally, um, 
we uh, add two keys, two uh, composite keys. Uh, one uh, about uh, the combination of room and arrival, uh, which means that uh, together room and arrival is a key. You can have uh, several arrival, as on, sorry, several reservation on the same arrival date in the same room. And also the other key that we mentioned might be a good idea to impose, uh, but we are not completely sure, uh, which is that uh, we can only have one guest arriving, uh, sorry, we cannot only have one reservation for a given guest uh, arriving on a given date, uh, which is the second uh, composite key that we have indicated. So if a key is elementary, we can just add a primary key or unique after its type. If a key is composite, we write it after the declaration of uh, everything else. We add a unique or primary key and then uh, uh, we specify everything. Uh, same for the check constraint. If you have a check constraint that uh, refers to several as different attributes, we can add it at the, at the end of the declaration. So it's quite a good idea, again, to add as many constraints as we can because it uh, allows us to uh, make sure that there will never be an update in the database that will uh, violate these basic, uh, these basic constraints, that we never accidentally forget to, rinse, to, uh, to put who the guest was in a reservation, or that we never accidentally put a, put a negative number of nights uh, in, a, in, a, in a reservation. Everything that you can enforce this way it's, it's a very basic layer of, uh, of protection and it's a good idea to, to do it. I want to, to uh, talk about something else, which is a link between uh, keys and uh, efficiency. Whenever you declare a key, whereas uh, it, it can be with a primary key or it can be with a unique statement, uh, the uh, database management system will automatically create an index uh, for the key. Uh, if it's a primary key, it's a primary index. If it's a unique, it's a secondary index, but this is a technical detail, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and what this means in practice is that if you have declared something to be a primary key, it will be very fast, or, or unique colon, it will be very fast to uh, look for information in the table uh, if you know the value for this attribute. If you will be very quick to do a selection, where the selection uh, uh, formula refers to this particular uh, attribute. Uh, you can also create indexes uh, without specifying that something is a key or a primary key. And in some cases, it makes sense. You want to create an index on a, on, on a column, and this column is not unique. Uh, I haven't shown the syntax for it. It's, there is a create index statement. Uh, you can look it up in the documentation. Uh, in practice, it's not that commonly needed. What is much more commonly needed is to be careful to specify uh, cleanly all the primary keys and unique columns, and this will give you indexes and efficiency uh, for free. Not quite for free because uh, building the index will take some time, but uh, you will not have to specify it manually. Okay, so this is it for the uh, data definition language. So how to specify the schema of your database, specify the tables, the attributes, their types, and the constraints. Also, how to, to remove a relation schema, uh, how to alter a relation schema, etc. Again, the details are, uh, for instance, can be found, for instance, in the Postgres documentation. Let's look now at the data manipulation language, which is the querying and updating parts of uh, SQL. Let's start with updates. Um, so obviously you need a mechanism to be able to add data to a table. And there is a, a statement in SQL for this, which is insert. So the syntax is insert into, it's always these two keywords together. Then the name of the table, then the list of attributes where you are going to provide values. If you're going to provide values for all attributes, you can uh, skip this list. Then the keyword values, and then the list of values that you put, uh, that you put there. So in this particular case, insert into guest ID name values five John, we have not specified anything for the uh, third attribute, which is the email attribute, uh, which was not specified to be not null. Uh, I'm just checking. So it means that the email attribute will be filled with null because we have not specified a, 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 value, uh, a value for it. Uh, in practice, it's common to, to give all the values of all the, all the attributes, and then you don't have to list exactly which attributes you fill in the value for. Then you need a way to remove a uh, tuple or a collection of tuple from the database. And to do that, uh, 
uh, you you do delete from uh, the name of the table where uh, and then uh, the condition uh, and every it's like a selection every uh, tuple that satisfies the condition will be removed from the from the table. Uh, so I uh, there is a remark about uh, where can where the slides and lab for today uh, can be found. I asked. Uh, several times for them to be uh, online. I don't know if they are now. Uh, yes, they, they, they seem to be uh, available now. Uh, so I'll, I'll just copy the, the, the link uh, to the uh, GitHub page where they are uh, available. So the slide I'm using uh, and also the lab session for this afternoon. And finally, we need also a way to modify tuples. So for instance, uh, change uh, all reservation for room 204 to room 205. And it's, uh, it is similar to the delete statements. We do update, the name of the table, set, and then we uh, say attribute equal value, comma attribute equal value, comma attribute equal value, where, and then a condition, when are we going to do this modification? I'm not going to insist a lot on uh, updates because probably you will not need them in the lab session, and it's actually fairly, fairly simple. I'm going to look more at the, at the queries. Uh, there is a way to insert several values at a time. Uh, so for instance, to fill in the guest and reservation table, uh, this could look like this. Uh, in, in practice, if you have a lot of values to insert, like what you will have in the lab session, you will have a big data set to insert in the table. You will not use insert, you will use another uh, statement which is copy, uh, which copies an entire uh, data set. And then you will have to um, add parameters to your copy statement to explain how to read your data set, to say that it's a CSV file, uh, what is the delimiter used, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's now look at queries. So we talked about queries uh, in the rel relational algebra setting. Now uh, we can uh, uh, see how they are expressed in practice in SQL. And I will take all the relational algebra operators and see how these operators can be expressed in SQL. So the general form of a query in SQL is select from, where, group by, having, and then possibly a, a, a Boolean operator such as union, and then you do another query uh, uh, afterwards. So select is compulsory. You always have a select uh, keyword in, um, in, uh, in a SQL query. And what's inside the select will allow you to express projection, renaming, and aggregation. Then you have a from. And you can use uh, uh, what's inside the from will express cross products and joins. Then you can have, it's optional, a where clause. The select and from are compulsory, the rest are all optional. You can have a where clause. Uh, and what you have in the where clause expresses the selections. And it's also another way to express the, the join with we'll, we'll see examples. Then you can have a group by clause. And if you have one, it expresses the grouping uh, of uh, aggregated values. Then you can have an having, a having clause, and if you have one, it expresses a selection on the aggregated result of the grouping. Uh, this is a bit niche, but uh, if you want to do a selection not on the base tuples, but on the results of the aggregated tuples, you can use having for that. And then if you want to combine several queries with a union or with a difference, uh, you, you are going to separate the queries with a union keyword or with an except keyword for the difference, uh, but it's obviously optional. There are other things, like if you want to sort the result of the query, you are going to use order by, and then the name of the attribute you want to order on, uh, in order to uh, have the result presented in an ordered fashion. So this is something that is quite interesting. Order, uh, the, the order the results appear, is actually not a part of the relational model. The relational model considers that you have uh, sets or possibly bags, but neither sets nor bags are ordered. There is no specific order in which to list the elements. And even SQL, actually, you can use order by, but order by only makes sense for the uh, outermost query, which means that if you have a query that uh, uses a subquery, that uses a subquery, whatever, it only makes sense to use order by uh, in the main query that it will return the result to the user. 
So Autobuy is not quite a, a part of the data model. It's just a way to present results, the final results for the user. Limit is uh, a way to limit uh, the result of a query to the first K. Uh, so this is quite useful when you manipulate a big data database and you just want to have a, a look at the first 10 lines of the table, for instance. You will just add limit 10 at the end of the, of the table. Distinct. Uh, uh, distinct is a keyword that is used to force set semantics. You use it within the select clause. Uh, and if you say select distinct and then an attribute name, instead of saying, saying select attribute name, it will remove all duplicates uh, for this, uh, for, uh, in the result of this, uh, of this column. And finally, uh, yeah, except I already mentioned, it's, yeah, it's, it's used in the same way as, uh, as Union. So let's go over the example that we had uh, of queries earlier and see how they are expressed in, uh, in SQL. Let's look at renaming, for instance. So in relational algebra, we had rin, uh, row ID uh, to guest of, ge uh, of guest. Uh, well, this is, again, renaming is expressed within the, um, uh, the select clause. And so in the select clause, you are going to list all the attributes that you want in your results table. And if you want to rename an attribute, you just write as. So select ID as guest, this is your renaming, and then name and email because you want to keep name and email as this. And in the from table, you say where from, in, in which, which uh, in, in the from clause, you, you, you say from which clause, uh, from which relation uh, you are doing the renaming. Okay, so this is quite simple. Projection. Uh, so for projection, you are going to use a select clause again. The select clause lists all the attributes that you want to project on. So select email ID from guest. In this particular case, if you want to simulate the set semantics, because we said that uh, we, we, we saw the uh, relational algebra with the set semantics, instead of writing just select, we are going to add select distinct. Uh, in order to get rid of possible duplicates when we when we do a projection. In this particular case, there wouldn't be any duplicate because we have declared that uh, both email and ID are, are keys of the guest colon. But if we had uh, projected on uh, name and ID, for instance, we could have had duplicates and it would have made a difference to select these things and uh, with respect to select uh, without the distinct keywords. Selection, so the selection is expressed in the where clause. So in this case, since we don't have any renaming or projection to do, the select clause will just have a star. Select star means that I'm, I'm keeping all the, all the attributes from the base tables. I'm not doing any renaming or I'm not doing any projection. Uh, so again, in the from, you have the table that uh, you apply the selection on. And so the where here, just express the condition. So there is some syntactic aspects that uh, dates need to be put in between quotes, for instance. But otherwise, it's exactly, and the, and the end Boolean operator needs to be written end uh, in, in all letters. But otherwise, it's exactly the uh, selection condition. Cross product. Okay, so I, I've written uh, it in a, in a bit of a, of a weird way here. Um, uh, oh no, no, it's, it, it's just because, okay, so it looks weird, but it's just because we are not doing just the, the cross product of two tables. We are doing the cross products of the results uh, of uh, two uh, subqueries. So here, if you look at the select distinct ID from guest, from guest sorry, this is a subquery project on ID of guest. Select this in ID from guest is just this simple subquery. Uh, you are allowed to use subqueries in the from uh, when you want to combine queries like, like what we have done here. If you use subqueries in the from, SQL asks you to name the results of every subquery. So I, I've named the result of the first subquery temp1 and the result of the second subquery temp2. And then since I'm doing a, since I'm doing a cross product, uh, I, I don't have anything to do in the select. I just do select star, get me everything. And the from, I'm just listing the two, uh, the two uh, tables I'm uh, computing the cross product of, which in this case are the two results of sub expressions. 
I've added the auto buy clause just to show an example of use of the auto buy clause. Obviously, it's not a part of the, the query itself, but if you want the result to be ordered by name and then by ID, if there are two names that I call, you would write it this way. Let's look at the union. Uh, so the union is quite simple. You have the two sub expressions. And so the two sub expressions are projection on the selection uh, on the selection on, on the reservation table. So you are expressing the projection in selects, so selection in the where, and uh, you give the name of the table in reservation, so it's very simple. Uh, you do that for both, uh, for both queries, and then you write union uh, between the two. Set difference, I mean, the relational difference is exactly the same. I'm just comparing both union with the union keyword. Uh, difference with the except keyword, no difference. In practice, uh, there are other ways to express difference and sometimes they're a bit more convenient than explicitly writing except. Um, there is a not in operator that you can use in the where clause, for instance, where you can say that uh, some attribute value is not in the result of a sub expression. It's, it's actually an alternative way of expressing a difference. And now, the, now let's look at the join. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's a good question. The union by default in SQL, which is a bit uh, actually weird because it's uh, it, you, SQL by default has a multi-set semantics, but the union operator and the except operator all filter redundant, uh, all filter duplicate results. Uh, re union and except, and, and uh, there is also intersect uh, in SQL, all uh, have a set semantics, even though SQL uh, uh, at large as a multi-set semantics. There is a variant of union and except and intersection, uh, which is union all, union space all. This is a different operator that this time will not uh, remove duplicates. Uh, but in most practical scenarios, you want to use union and not union all. Okay, let's look at the join. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, join of the two tables, reservation and guests. Joining on the attribute guests of reservation should be equal to attribute ID of guests. So there are two main ways of expressing a join. One way is to explicitly write the join in the from clause. Uh, so here I want, uh, so in the select clause, I'm saying what attributes I want as a result. So it's a projection part if you want. Uh, I want all the attributes of reservation plus the name and email, but I don't want the ID. If I was happy to have uh, uh, also the ID of guest, I would have just have put select star. Uh, there would have been an issue because I would have two attributes that are named ID. Uh, Postgres allows this issue as long as you are not trying to create a new table uh, that has these, uh, these two ID attributes. So in the select clause, I put whatever attributes I want in the result. Uh, in the, you can see an example here where I wrote reservation dot star to say every attribute of reservation, uh, so, so I didn't have to list them all. And in the from close, I explicitly write the join uh, using a syntax that is quite close to the rational algebra syntax. I'm writing reservation join guest on guest equals client dot it. But there is another way to express the same thing, which is just to write in the from close all the tables that you are going to use, and in the where clause to add the join condition. Uh, so if you think about it a little bit, the first uh, expression is equivalent to actually writing a join. The second is equivalent to re rewriting of a join as a cross product with uh, <coughs> projection and selection. But as you mentioned, both of them will have the same efficiency. Both of them will, will, uh, will be a, a, a will be treated uh, uh, as, a, as a join uh, independently of how you write it. It's really a matter of taste uh, uh, how you prefer to write a join. I usually much prefer the second uh, because it's, uh, it can be cumbersome to have all the join in the condition. For two tables, it's fine, but you have, when you have five tables, you need, you need to change the join and it, it becomes re rapidly ugly. Whereas uh, with, with, if you put them in the where clause, uh, it's quite simple to do uh, all the all the uh, all the join condition with just uh, uh, adding end and and in between every join condition. That being said, 
there is a danger in using a second um, uh, way of writing, which is that if you forget the joint condition, if you forget the way are closed, you are actually computing a cross product. And uh, if you, it will probably uh, not be what you want and it will probably be too costly and uh, will result in a query that will uh, run uh, for too long a time. Uh, you don't have the problem in the first uh, writing because uh, when you write join, you have to say explicitly uh, uh, what is your join condition and you will never have a cross product instead. But again, however you write it, it will be executed in the, in the same way, in the most efficient way as judged by the database management system. And finally, aggregation. So I put the same aggregation as before. So if you remember, uh, we want to compute the average number of nights reserved uh, over all the reservation for each room. And we want to keep all the rooms that are re re reserved in average for more than three nights. Um, <coughs> so uh, uh, I, I'll answer the question about uh, other forms of join afterwards. Uh, so um, we write it in this way. In the select, we put whatever attribute you want as a result. Here we want room because we are grouping by room. And we want the aggregation. And the aggregation, uh, I want to uh, compute the average function, which is an aggregate function. There are other aggregate functions like min, max, uh, count, sum of the nights column. And this is just some renaming as average. I want to rename it as average. From only one, I'm only using one relation, the reservation relation. Group by, here I'm writing my group by, and there is a rule in uh, aggregate queries, which is that every attribute that you put in a select clause has to be either in the group by clause or the result of an aggregation. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense because you, you cannot uh, keep the individual values of attributes without aggregate, aggregating them, but you, could, you can group by these attributes. And for the selection that comes on the result of the aggregation, you can put it in the having clause. And you can drop uh, an order by clause if you want to, to sort the result by a room number, for instance. So let me get back to the join. So I have a question about uh, what is uh, left and right joins. Uh, so this is uh, usually not, uh, I mean, it, it's, it is sometimes useful, but it's not uh, uh, that, that often useful. There are other forms of join than the uh, full join that I've presented here, uh, where you just want to keep all tuples in a uh, table. If there is a matching tuple is an, in another table, uh, and this, you would call it uh, a left or right join, depend, depending on uh, if the matching uh, uh, or the position of the ma matching ma matching table. Uh, so in some uh, situation, this left or right join, which is not computing the full join results, but just keeping the uh, tuples if they have a matching result in another uh, in another table, makes sense and are useful. But uh, you can. You, you, you can look for examples online. I've, I've not included an example of it. OK. And that's basically it for a high level view of SQL. So again, whenever you have to write a SQL query, you will have to have a query of the form select from, maybe a where, maybe a group by if you have aggregation, maybe a having if you have a, a, a selection on the results of the group by, maybe an order by, maybe a limit, et cetera. But you always start with a select and from. And it's, it's fairly natural where to put all the operators. You can refer to, to, to all the examples. So you should have everything you need for uh, uh, this afternoon's lab. I will talk briefly about uh, how the lab is going to, to proceed uh, uh, at the end. But before that, I want to discuss at a high level, I'm not going to enter into much details, uh, other forms of the database management system than uh, the um, classical relational database management system that I've uh, discussed uh, so far. So classical relational database management systems have quite a number of strengths. Uh, they are very good at some things. So first, they, have, uh, they maintain uh, a notion of independence between the data model and the storage structure. When you use SQL, 
you never have to know how the data is stored on disk. Uh, there is uh, always, uh, you always manipulate the relational data model. You never have to care uh, uh, where it is stored on disk, uh, in which file, uh, if you are in a distributed setting uh, on which of the peer or, uh, of the cluster, etc. And it also maintains an independence between the declarative uh, level, uh, declarative way you write your queries and the way the queries are actually executed. So when you use a classical relational database management system, uh, it's actually quite uh, easy to remain at a high level without going deep into the way that uh, uh, the storage or the queries are implemented, which is not always the case in, uh, in other database management systems. It provides you with a complex query language. So within SQL, you have all of the relational algebra, but you also have aggregation, which is more or less, can, can more or less be also part of the relational algebra. But you also have uh, functionalities to do recursion, which I have not presented because uh, uh, it's, it's a bit elaborate, but they exist. Uh, and you also have a few, a few more things, which means that uh, altogether you get a very rich query language that allows to, explain, to express quite complex uh, uh, queries uh, in your in your database, uh, rational DBMSs are quite good at query optimization. Uh, they are quite good at uh, maintaining indexing structures to allow quick access uh, to data. And in practice, it's it's fast. It's good. It works. Uh, it's also systems that. Uh, are very mature. So the, the first uh, DMSs that date from the end of the 70s, we have decades of experience over them. Uh, a system like Oracle really has uh, decades of, uh, of experience. Even a system for uh, open source systems like MySQL or Postgres are quite mature now. They are stable. Uh, we have a stable interface. You have a, a stable query language that you can use. They are efficient. And they have a lot of features and a lot of ways to access them. Uh, it's easy to um, access any forms of any form of the database management system from any kind of programming language that you can imagine. Uh, they are very good at maintaining integrity constraints on data. Uh, they they do that uh, fine, and it's one of their strengths to be able to express fairly complex integrity constraints on on the data, either directly as I showed you, or with even more elaborate. Uh, uh, ways using triggers. And in practice, they are efficient at managing large volumes of data. Uh, it's not a problem at all to manage gigabytes of data. It's not even a problem to manage terabytes of data with uh, uh, re classical relational database management systems. If you start having, let's say, I don't know, more than, a, more than 10 terabytes of data that you need to process efficiently, then you might start uh, encountering uh, problems using classical uh, DBMSs. If you have anything under that, no problem at all. And then there is something that I haven't talked about much, but it's quite important, which is the transaction system of the uh, uh, database management system, which is uh, a notion that you have uh, um, when, when you are doing accesses to the database, uh, accesses are um, regrouped into transactions, which are a set of elementary operations uh, that allows to properly manage uh, concurrency between different users accessing the database at the same time. Use the so user isolation in particular to make sure that, uh, that the uh, that a user uh, in progress transaction doesn't have an impact on another user. And also error recovery uh, that are also used to manage what happens if there is a, a power failure. More precisely, uh, classical DBMSs uh, have transactions that have properties that are called ACIDs uh, for uh, these four um, uh, properties. A is for atomicity, which means that whenever you uh, issue a transaction, so a, a sequence of operations, either the entire sequence of operation is executed as one operation, as a block, or it's canceled. But you cannot have part of the operation that are executed and part that are not executed. This is extremely useful for all kinds of reasons. Uh, for, for instance, uh, assume that you are doing um, uh, an information system of a bank and you want to implement a, 
a bank transfer uh, between two internal accounts. Well, typically you want to remove money from one account and add it to another account. And you do want these two operations to be within transaction because you don't want, uh, for whatever reason, the transaction to stop in, in the middle. For instance, it could stop in the middle because there is a power failure. It could stop in the middle because when you try to add the money to the other account, uh, you, the, the other account has been closed in between and uh, you cannot add the money. Or for any kind of reasons, the database system guarantees that uh, what happens within a transaction is either executed altogether or not at all. So this is actually a complex, uh, uh, a complex uh, functionality. Uh, in order to do that, you need uh, to uh, to do some uh, to to keep track of everything that you do to be able to cancel what you have done uh, if uh, if a transaction is cancelled, for instance. Uh, but this is a, an extremely useful feature as well. Consistency of ACID means that um, uh, the transaction will respect the integrity constraint of the database. You will uh, be guaranteed that at every point your database remains in a consistent state. In a consistent state. Isolation, meaning that two users accessing the database concurrently uh, will, uh, uh, so they start transaction at the same time, where everything happens as if one transaction was done before the other, uh, as done uh, uh, as if the uh, execution of the transaction were made one after the other, which means that a user cannot be affected by the partial results of the transaction of another user. And this is very important. And finally, the D of ACID means durability, which means that once a transaction has been confirmed, we say it has been committed, the data remains durably stored in the hardware, and it remains there. There is a guarantee that uh, the data is there, even in case of, uh, of failure. Obviously, if uh, there is a huge failure, meaning that the entire computer on which the data was stored is destroyed, then you cannot do much. But if there is a minor failure of the sense that uh, the power cut just afterwards, we will be able to restore the data in a, in a way that uh, keep track of this committed transaction. So these are for the strengths of the classical DBMSs. Now they, are, they have weaknesses also. The first one I've already mentioned is that if you want to manage a very extremely large volume of data of the order of uh, petabytes, then, uh, so an order of magnitude larger than terabytes, uh, then you encounter a problem if you, if you try to do this with uh, regular databases. Uh, it's not completely impossible. So for instance, uh, uh, the Facebook initially, uh, what, they what they had done to store the data, I mean, Facebook was not uh, very well programmed uh, in some sense. Uh, they used the MySQL initially for storing the data. And obviously, at some point, uh, the, they couldn't just use one uh, uh, the MySQL database because the, the volume of the data they had to store was too much. <laughs> what they did is that they just split the users according to whatever, the ID or the name or whatever, and just, just use different uh, databases installed on different machines, on different clusters of machines, uh, to store uh, part of the database. Uh, so this is the way to do it, but it means that you don't have a, a global view of the entire database. You need to know which uh, sub-database to contact, etc. So this is not a very scalable way, and nowadays Facebook doesn't uh, doesn't do this anymore. Uh, but not everyone is not everyone is Facebook, or not everyone is Google. Not everyone has petabytes of data to store. So if you don't have petabytes of data to store, uh, if you don't have uh, more than I don't know a dozen terabytes to store. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about uh, uh, classical DBMS being able to um, store your data. Classical DBMSs are not also able to manage extreme loads. Uh, they, they can be quite quick and can be quite efficient and they can be configured to, to, to be even more responsive. But if you assume that you will have a load of queries that is of the order of, uh, you have thousands of queries or even more every second, then probably a relational database management system is not what you want because they are not meant to, uh, to, to deal with these extreme bandwidths of, uh, of queries. So if you are Google and you, have a, and you want to power your Google search engine, uh, then you probably don't want to use a classical relational database management system because you will have more than uh, uh, thousands of queries per, per, per second. But again, not everyone is in, this, is in this situation. Then there is a fact that uh, some kinds of data, I mean, 
if you use a classical DBMS, you have to store everything in tables. There are some things that don't fit very well into tables. You can encode everything into tables. You can put everything into tables if you want. But things like graphs, things like hierarchical data, things like data that, are, that have very little structure don't fit very well into tables. And so if you put them in a relational database management system, maybe you don't get to exploit all the features of the database management system because the data is, is, is not structured in a, in a way that is compatible. Then there is a fact that ACID properties are a great uh, advantage of uh, database management systems, but they are also uh, a huge uh, source of overheads uh, because we need to make sure that transactions are, probably, are properly managed. Uh, we need to um, uh, put locks on a lot of things. Uh, we need to add a, a logging mechanism to record everything we do. Uh, uh, we need to manage the um, the access to the disk in a in, in a careful way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of this is actually quite a huge source of overhead. Uh, there have been some studies that on typical benchmarks, on typical uses of a database, uh, more than half of the time uh, is used not to access data, not to retrieve data, not to process data, but for all this uh, overhead uh, in uh, in, in uh, accessing the data because of uh, maintaining uh, ACID transactions. And then there is another thing, which is that all database management systems are under the assumption that you are going to store data on disk. Uh, and actually they are very well optimized uh, to uh, get, collect data efficiently from disk, typically uh, uh, magnetic hard drives. Uh, if Actually, you want to store data in memory and have a much more uh, efficient access to data than what you can do in disk. Then uh, classical DBMSs are not really uh, appropriate because they are not used to deal with data stored in memory. They really rely on the fact that uh, data is on uh, secondary storage. So for this reason, a bunch of other uh, approaches to uh, managing data have been proposed. Um, and so I'm going to, to review them uh, briefly. We don't have that, that much time. So they have been put into the, um, into the header of NoSQL databases, NoSQL or maybe not only SQL. Uh, and basically it just means that they are database management systems, but they have made different decisions. They have made different trade-offs than those made by the classical system. It's extremely diversified. Uh, there are very, very different things within uh, the NoSQL ecosystem. Uh, usually people want a different data model. Usually people want better performances, uh, maybe a transparent scaling up, which means that you, if you have twice more data, you put twice more machines and this just works. This is not the case with the classical databases. Uh, extreme performances. Um, uh, and uh, you have to make trade-offs, so you have to abandon some things. And usually what is abandoned is uh, to have a strong concurrency control, asset transactions, possibly complex queries. So the first class is systems that have a different data model. Uh, they support complex queries. They have a quite similar design as a classical relational database management system, but they don't organize data into tables. So these are XML databases, which use XQuery as a query language. Object-oriented databases, uh, there are a few uh, object uh, programming languages. These category of uh, databases, uh, which was actually quite promising, uh, is, is a bit uh, uh, getting extinct. Uh, graph databases, uh, that allows to store things like uh, social networks, attributed graphs uh, in, a, in an efficient way. And there are uh, query languages uh, specific to that. There are um, graph query languages that are being standardized uh, as we speak. And triple stores, uh, which are similar to graph databases, but uh, they are used to store more specifically graphs that represent semantic facts from the semantic web with a standard query language is uh, Sparkle and are quite good at this particular uh, uh, data storage. Then there are things like key value stores where you choose to have an extremely basic data model uh, and an extremely basic query model. So your data is just pairs of key and values and your queries are get me the value that is associated with the key or add a new key value pair or delete uh, the value associated with the key, obviously. 
Uh, so it's a very basic compared to what you can do in SQL, obviously. But by uh, choosing to have extremely basic um, uh, data access and query language, uh, you can put the stress on transparent scaling up, on the low latency, on the very high bandwidth of queries uh, processed, etc. Uh, some some of the techniques that I use, are, for instance, use uh, distributed hash tables. And these are things like the DynamoDB database of uh, Amazon, uh, like the Project Voldemort, uh, like uh, in-memory databases such as uh, MemcacheDB or Redis, uh, like Code, which is a distributed hash table, etc. Document stores are actually fairly comparable to the previous one, except that you are also storing key value pairs, but the values are more complex. The value are documents like JSON documents or XML documents or YAML documents. Uh, and the basic queries are also quite simple. You get a document and you put a new document. Now, you can do more things than with key value stores because uh, you can build additional indexes to, for instance, index uh, documents containing a keyword, having a given property, etc. But conceptually, the query language is more akin to the query language of key value stores than to a full fledged query language like uh, SQL. Uh, there is a lot of uh, stress in these uh, databases into the document uh, uh, properties like uh, metadata associated to documents, document versions, uh, uh, authors of documents, uh, these kind of things. Uh, so for some particular kind of, uh, of data, this is quite appropriate. And there's also a lot of effort that's put on interface simplicity, ease of handling in a programming language actually more than on the, on, on the performance. So this is an example of MongoDB or CouchDB. Column stores, uh, so the basic idea of column stores is that instead of storing data row after row, you store it column after column. Uh, this doesn't seem to be a big change, but uh, it actually is. Uh, it provides for a richer organization than key value stores, but usually for less strong query language than, than SQL. Uh, and it makes things like aggregating the values of a given column or scanning the value of a given column uh, much more efficient. Uh, some of them are, uh, uh, are oriented towards uh, large scaling uh, to thousands of machines. Some of them are more uh, uh, orient oriented to uh, local storage of data. Uh, Bigtable or its uh, age base uh, clone uh, uh, are examples of this. Uh, and so they provide a number of features that are a bit intermediary between key value stores and uh, fully fledged uh, uh, relational database management systems. And then there is another keyword, which is another buzzword, which is new SQL, uh, which is uh, some have been introduced a bit more recently, where people have realized that, okay, all these new no SQL systems are great, but uh, we still want to do SQL. We still want to have a rich query language. We still want to have acid properties. But we want to do better. We want to have a higher performance than classical DBMS. So how can we do that? Well, basically by, again, making different technical choices in classical uh, DBMSs, try to get rid of locks, logging, cache management by using other algorithms, other algorithms that, uh, that are maybe more efficient, but also have, a, uh, for instance, a higher memory footprint, main memory footprint. Uh, maybe by putting all the data in main memory with a secondary asynchronous copies on disk, but accessing the data directly from memory instead of accessing them from, from disk. So having uh, things like um, log-free uh, concurrent management, like motivation concurrency control, uh, all kind of technical things. The idea is to try and keep the, what we can of classical systems, but have higher performances. Uh, by making, again, different comprom compromises. Uh, these systems, for instance, may use a lot more, more uh, main memory than the systems that, uh, of um, than the classical original database management systems. So as a kind of conclusion, when, when should you go for these NoSQL or NoSQL systems, or, and when should you stick to the proven classical original database management system? Well, if you have extreme bandwidth or latency requirements, latency meaning the, the time needed uh, between you issue your request and you, the time you get your answer, uh, so if they are extreme, if you need an answer uh, in less than a millisecond, if you, if you need to, uh, to process uh, tens of thousands of queries per second, then probably you need something else than uh, Postgres or Oracle. If you have extreme data volumes, again, probably you need something else. 
if the relational model really poorly suits what you are going to store, maybe it doesn't make sense to um, to force your model into in, in to, to force your data into the relational model. When you have tested, you have tried to use the classical database management systems, and they are uh, they are they have insufficient performance. But you have to know what you lose depending on what you choose instead. You lose acid transactions, you lose the possibility of complex querying, uh, you lose the stability also of well established software, which is uh, something not, not negligible. Uh, so just I just want to uh, say, say that there are real need for NoSQL and NoSQL databases, but this need is over over uh, is often overestimated. I mean, it's it's often uh, chosen as a as a basic choice. Uh, let's go. Uh, let, let's implement this with MongoDB uh, when this actually might not be the the, the right uh, tool for for the job. Okay. Um, in the in this last slide, so you can find the slide on the on the course website. Uh, I I put a few references if you want to go further. Uh, the, the first reference is um, some generality of data management research. If you want to understand what is research in, in data management, uh, so there is a, a book chapter in English and, uh, and uh, a booklet in, in French that tries to explain what is this field, what is this area, uh, why is it an interesting area. Uh, if you want a, a kind of textbook refresher on uh, databases, there is a, a, a nicely written course in French on the curriculum of the of databases in the class preparatoire in 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 France that you can have a look. All the references are given in the next slides. Uh, I won't show them, but they, they are uh, they are they are online on the course website. And then, um, if you want to go into the details, uh, if you want to uh, of the rational models, rational algebra, there is a very nice textbook which is called Foundation of Databases, and what I've covered is basically chapters three and four of this uh, of this textbook. The so detail of SQLs, unfortunately, the standards are not public. Uh, ISO is, uh, is quite bad at that. So they, they sell the standards uh, for huge amounts of money. So you cannot actually read the original source. But then the standards are not very readable either. They are written in uh, legalese. It's not, it's not a very nice uh, thing to read. Uh, better to use the documentation of the DBMS that, that you are using. And in particular, Postgres has a very nice online documentation and also the documentation that you can use with the uh, command line uh, uh, tool, not guest, I'm not sure why I wrote uh, guest, with the command line uh, tool, uh, PS PSQL. Okay, so that's it for uh, this morning's lecture. Uh, just a few words about uh, this afternoon. So we are uh, resuming with the lab session at uh, 2 p.m., if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, so the uh, topic of the lab, uh, uh, I mean, the assignment for the lab session uh, is on the course website uh, as well. So you'll find it at the URL I, I posted. Uh, there is a section on it, uh, prerequisites. Uh, if you have a bit of time before 2 p.m., it's good if you can do the prerequisites just to install PSQL, which is a, uh, a Postgres uh, client. Uh, and uh, to install two Python packages, which are uh, Cycle PG2 and, uh, and, and uh, SciPy, if you don't have a SciPy yet, uh, which will be useful to, to gain some time. Otherwise, we'll do it at the beginning of the, of the course. So for the uh, lab session, I'm not completely sure how the other teachers managed. Uh, I'll try to use the key, uh, uh, Discord and basically answer to, uh, uh, to question on the Discord chat uh, and try to help you uh, as much as possible. Uh, if uh, if needed, I'm, I might activate the uh, I, I might add a voice chat in Discord to to explain some things. But we'll we'll try to do everything within the chat room. Um, yeah, so there is a, a, a last question that classical DBMSs have been converting many of the tools from NoSQL and the like. Uh, it's, it's true, many of the things uh, that have been proposed by, uh, by uh, NoSQL systems have been added one way or another. Uh, not everything, I mean, I mean, basically you cannot change the entire architecture of the DBMS. But things like support for um, uh, additional data models, like uh, graph data models or uh, XML data models, Yes, have been incorporated into Oracle, for instance. Uh, I mean, the Oracle database engine is, is really a, a huge thing, and so it supports a lot of different data models, not just relational data models. Uh, but I'm not sure it's, it's a solution in the long term. 
in the sense that uh, if you really want, if you really need the different trade-offs, then you really need to make deep architectural changes from the from the beginning. And for this, you, you need to start with something different. Uh, what's true on the other hand is that, uh, uh, so for instance, uh, I've, I've, I've put a reference to, uh, no, I, I didn't put a reference, but uh, um, MySQL has a version that is uh, more designed uh, to, to be used uh, in, um, uh, in, in a distributed and RAM and memory environment. But it's it's almost a different kind of uh, of software than uh, than the original MySQL. It's difficult to just push into uh, the classical DBMSs uh, features that's actually completely different from uh, from uh, the design decision of these systems. Okay, so uh, let's end now, and uh, we'll we'll meet on the Discord chat uh, at uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. Goodbye.